audio conversation with Robert Burke recorded Thursday, October 6th, 2014. This conversation wasn't really done uh, to be posted online, wasn't done as a podcast. Uh, who knows what the future will bring? It may show up uh, in one form or another, maybe an excerpt, maybe the whole thing someday. But at present, it is only meant as a document, uh, just to help to organize some thoughts and uh, and just put a date on some things. Robert and I spoke on Monday, the 3rd of November. Uh, after exchanging a couple of emails, we spoke on the phone, had a conversation. That was our first time talking. The next morning... Tuesday the 4th, Robert gets up, lets his dogs out, and as he is uh, standing there at the door, he hears an owl hooting in a nearby tree, which is very unusual. He has not heard that before. Uh, this, curiously, does not surprise me. I have, in an odd way, come to expect that, uh, that when people interact with me, especially at these highly charged uh, uh, subjects, you know, what we were talking about, what we talk about in this conversation that's about to unfold for whoever listens, that, uh, you know, that that owls, for reasons I do not understand, but I can say that it does happen, owls will show up sometimes. Uh, He had never heard an owl from that location before or anywhere near there before, and and it happened that day. Now, I'll also say that Tuesday, the 4th of November, the morning he heard the owl, is also a highly charged day in, in his life. That was the election day for the governor's uh, election. Very interesting. This audio document runs about two hours long, and I hope whoever listens to it finds the content useful. Thank you. Uh, So I don't have any kind of list of questions. I'll just sort of, like, listen, and I've got my own kind of, you know, whatever. It's a working, I don't want to say theory. I'll call it a cloud, let's say, on Mm -hmm. how this stuff plays out. Um, So, hey, how'd the election go? Uh, I got I got absolutely crushed. Um, this election, and this is interesting. I've said this for the entire election uh, campaign. This election wasn't about ideas. Uh, this was about um, I have to vote for the red team or the blue team wins. I have to vote for the blue team or the red team wins. And people would not uh, a very small number of people um, would peel away from that idea. Uh, the same thing happened to Gary Johnson in 2012. People just, it was, I, I know I don't like Mitt Romney. He's the worst candidate ever, but I got to vote for Mitt Romney or Barack Obama wins. I got to vote for Barack Obama or Mitt Romney wins. Meanwhile, I meet people every time I go out, Mike, who say, man, I just really like what you're saying. I think you really get the issues, but I just can't risk it this election. And then this is how they keep us in these elections. From It's, it's, it's crisis election to crisis election. I got, uh, but I did get about 18,000 votes. Oh, oh, well, that's great. Okay, yeah. So, so in in uh, in uh, so two thousand. Just thinking of the the, the two thousand and whatever when Barack Obama ran against Mitt Romney. How just twenty twelve. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, yes. How how um, uh, just how weird it got. You know, I mean, I guess it always gets weird. But I mean, that's a that's a that's a you know election on a huge scale. I suspect the statewide elections have the ability to whatever everything's dialed down a percentage as far as the the the, the spin doctors you know but uh they still spend 30 million dollars though uh, between the two of them an unbelievable amount of money for wisconsin mm-hmm. wow and then so who did win uh scott walker won again and is he the democrat or the republican he's the republican okay in and, fact i've got some interesting and i thought we talked a little bit before about that i'll share it again uh, about uh, scott walker that was part of that's part of this that's part of the uh uh synchronicities that are just so odd in this whole story okay keep going yeah are we recording yeah yeah we're rolling yeah yeah we're rolling so oh i can i can well, clean out the, the beginning there so yeah no no that's great yeah i, I want to start um first of all i want to say this and i know it's always uh, it's usually your line but i want to say this michael um uh, thank you for doing this interview it really does i mean this means a lot to me and i want to share with you one thing that's most uh, uh interesting i you know i sent this email to you and i asked you know so what i'm doing is i'm writing a book Okay. And what I do with this book is I try to take things that I think fit into the narrative of what's happening on the grand scale. You know, at 10,000 feet, if you looked around and you said, what's the theory of everything, Bob? What's happening? Um, I think this whole thing is about disclosure. And uh, in that email, uh, I, I wrote uh, specifically 
that um, I really was trying to get a hold of your attention. I, I really mean this. I've been told that I need to talk to you. I've got to share this idea with someone and talk this out, and I want to get this on uh, record. So this morning I got up, and um, I said, you know what? I'm going to go get the very first journal that I wrote. Um, I, I, you know, I knew that I wrote it. I started this thing about two years ago or so. And, uh, but I thought, you know what? I've got all of these things I want to talk to you about, you know, things that have happened, places that I've been. And um, so I went and I grabbed the first journal. And I opened it up this morning. And you're not going to believe this. This is when I began writing this journal. November 6, 2012, at 1010 10 a.m. And today's November 6th, and it's 10.10 10 in about two minutes for you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did not, when I called you, when I emailed you, when we spoke and we picked this time, I had no idea, honestly. I had no idea the exact date and time that I began uh, writing this. This is the synchronicity that I am, I opened this up this morning, I went, whoa, oh my gosh, hold on. And uh, and this is part of that same idea of where things got really, really just weird uh, in terms of my story and in terms of what I'm covering. And so we talk about Scott Walker. One of the things that happened when I was uh, putting together the plan for the election was I, I said, you know, I'm looking for a candidate to run for governor. I really didn't want it to be me. I, I don't want the attention. I can be a quirky guy, you know. Um, but uh, I started looking up. You know, well, okay. So, what is what are Scott Walker's qualifications for being governor? And I pulled him up on Wikipedia, and I come to find out that um, he was born November second, nineteen sixty-seven, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. My mother is, is originally from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, in fact, the whole family's there um, originally. Uh, not that I, my family had anything to do with his family, but um, she would have been probably fourteen, I think, at the time that he was born. Um, she was dating a guy in the Air Force when she was born, when, when she got pregnant. And uh, the gentleman was there for training and apparently left before she knew she was pregnant. She was dating a guy from the Army. The guy from the Army then, um, her mother, when she found out she was pregnant, said to the guy, look, uh, either marry her or I'm going to train you in for statutory rape. She's only 17 years old and she's pregnant and dating you. So he did. Uh, and he sent her to Plainfield, Illinois, where uh, a month before she uh, was to give birth, she realized that this wasn't a long-term relationship, walked into a lawyer's office and gave me up for adoption. And that would have been in December, uh, well, November, uh, if it was a month before my birthday, November 4th or 5th of, uh, 2000, of 1969. Um, but what's interesting is, so she moved to Plainfield, Illinois, and then in 1971, Scott Walker moved to Plainfield, Iowa. Um, in 1976, we opened a cabin up in Door County, Wisconsin. And in 1977, Scott Walker moved to the Dells in Wisconsin. Um, he went to Boy State. I went to Boy State. And Boy he State to, is a college in? No, Boy State is the uh, oh, it's a Boy citizen State? government. Okay. It's, it, it's, a, it's a summer week-long program where you learn about government. You, you start at the local level doing the parks commissions okay. and a mayor and the city council. And you do the county and then the state. Um he did Wisconsin's. I did Illinois. You know, and these and not that there aren't a lot of kids, but actually there really aren't. I mean, out of my class of three hundred and well, let's see, boys, there were you know, probably one hundred and sixty or one hundred and eighty boys. Uh, there were only, I think, uh, eight of us that went. I mean, it's a pretty small group of people in any class or any school that ever go. Um, what was interesting then is that in nineteen eighty six, the 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 guy that handled my adoption was actually my next door neighbor growing up. His son was my best friend. Uh, he went off to school at Marquette University in 1986, which happens to be the exact same year Scott Walker went to Marquette University in 1986. Um, when I went to college, uh, so 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 anyway, this, these synchronicities are just very odd, and they culminate in the fact that uh, in, in college I met my best friend. His birthday is November second, nineteen seventy three. When I met my wife, her birthday is November 1st, 1973, and her best friend is November 2nd, 1973. Scott Walker's birthday is November 2nd, 1973. I have these four individuals that have, you know, a lot of impact to my life, which birthdays are all on the same exact day, uh, three of them in the exact same year. And in fact, my best man, my best friend from college, is actually now working for Scott Walker uh, in his administration. Uh, and... Um, you know, so just just all of these odd synchronicities kind of match up, including that this year it wasn't just Scott Walker is running for governor, but Mary Burke. And you know, what's the what are the odds of the name and birth dates and uh, and so many synchronicities over the time that just kind of come up? It was just really odd. Um, it just seemed very odd to me. But um, 
so I started writing this book. I was laid off in 2012. I started writing this book. And originally what I thought I was writing the book about was uh, an economic collapse. I, I thought, you know what, I- I'm going to – I'm gonna. in 2008, I was working for, an, for a financial services company. And I thought, I'm paying attention. I pay attention because I work with brokers and it's my job to pay attention. And um, I had no idea we had a bubble in housing whatsoever. And I worked for a company that had a mortgage insurance company attached to it. And all of a sudden, our stock's you know, dropping $6 a share, $4 a share. In fact, it bottomed out at $0.72 cents a share. And uh, it, it, it jarred me. And I realized that uh, in 2012 when I was laid off, I realized, you know, something that would be really interesting for people is to be able to – journal my experience of the collapse. You can't go back and recapture what happened every single day just by going through the internet because you can't really you can't really google what happened November 1st, 2006. You know, that, that just doesn't exist in the in the realm of internet. But I thought I I've read journals before. I've read, you know, Reagan's diaries for example. I thought this would be a really interesting book for people to be able to read after the collapse. What did I miss? How did I not see all of this coming? And so I began writing the book. And originally, the majority of the material in the book was, um, you know, economics-based, uh, you know, capturing, um, you know, what's happening in the stock market and, uh, you know, if there's major changes in volume or anything like that. But the most interesting thing happened to me in 2013. Um, I was sitting at my desk here on uh, Monday, April 29th, and, um, you know, I sent an email to you yesterday that uh, the oddest thing happened about an owl. I've never heard. (laughs) I I do not live around. I'm not surrounded by trees, Michael. You know, I I live uh, on a two-acre plot. Uh, There's some, um, not even pines there. Uh, anyway, uh, so these aren't trees that owls would be able to sit and, you know, peer down below for prey. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're, they're pines, but they're, you know, they're, they're the scrub pines. Um, and I, I, I sit down yesterday outside my window, and, and, and I hear an owl uh, clearly hooting outside my window. I, I, you know, I've never uh, heard that before. It was the oddest thing. Well, and that was the was day sitting, after we talked. That, that was the day the after next, we talked. Yeah. The next morning uh, after. Because um, it would have been later in the afternoon for you. and yeah, so, so now just so you know. That has become so normal for me. I have that same response from people to the point where, like, at first it really freaked me out. And now if I don't get it, well, now if someone doesn't say, come back to me and say, oh, I saw an owl, I get worried. Like, I, I recognize the, um, whatever, the, the synchronistic power is what it allows me to do in a way you know, it's not it's not like proof of any way, but it is a confirmation it, at a... Uh, it is a confirmation that whatever's going on, you know, you either you're 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 looking in the right direction or you're so so that's so so that's my sense, very much my sense, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's uh, one of these things. So I went through this morning, you know, it's a couple of things. Um this one here uh was a journal entry that I made back in uh Oh, I don't know. Mid uh, four nine thirteen uh, was when this was in, and I did this because this is important. I wanted people to know that. Look, when I write the time in my journals, these are the actual times that they hit me, um, because there's been all these synchronicities. For example, when I started the Libertarian Party up here in Pearson St. Croix, um, uh, my my daughter and I, my daughter was uh, with me to go put up posters. We got gas. I sat down in the car and I look up, and there's the bank clock right there, and it says eleven eleven. Um, and it's, you know, as you know, a lot of people who are looking at this, it's a lot of synchronicity. But I'm sitting in my office on the 29th of April, and a helicopter flies past outside my window um, by my house. I've lived here for 11 years at the oh, time. Okay, there's two dots in the photo. Yep, the, this was a cool, the cool picture. The first one on the left is a... Uh, yeah, this one over here. This is actually a uh, a wasp. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then the one over on the other side here. This is one of those double big helicopters. A um... was it taken through a window, so the wasp was. No, the I was outside. No, the wa- no. This is I was right outside my front door. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, this is very unusual. And ever since that moment, I've been starting to get helicopters. That, I don't think these are circling around me. Uh, they changed the base apparently over in St. Paul. It was a training base, a very small part time for. Um, 
helicopter pilots to get training, and then all of a sudden they switched it to a full-time training base. And I've had these flying in our area, over our house, past my yard, um, constantly for the last oh year and a half now. Um, but I'm sitting in my office, and I'm always you know looking for things to write about. And I've followed the UFO issue for some time, and I've always you know watched the shows and wondered what you know what really was there. I I, I believe that uh, we're being visited. That's always been you know part of my. Uh, my belief system. In fact, uh, right before I went in the Air Force, I remember sitting in my room, you uh, listening to the radio when the news came on, and they said, uh, we have a confirmation that an airline pilot uh, and his co-pilot have both confirmed they saw an unidentified circular object flying past them. And this was the first time I remember hearing that. In fact, I was trying to find it this morning. I actually journaled when I was in high school. And um, in here somewhere is that moment I captured in, in time uh, and this was probably within a week before I went into the Air Force, which is another one of those odd Id- idiosyncrasies about uh, my life. Um, about 15 years ago, I met my birth mother. And, um, you know, what's interesting, Mike, is people, I, you wonder what that question would be when you're given up for adoption at birth. And people say, Bob, what's, what's that most important thing? What's the first question that you want to ask? And for me, it was, what's my heritage? What's my genetic heritage? What's my lineage, you know, uh, which was really interesting. And one of the reasons that I, that I really wanted to do this interview now is because I feel like I got this last piece of a puzzle, um, and not that there aren't still some big pieces of the puzzle still missing, but when I, when I, when I listened to the Dan Sherman interview, and I think we talked about this, you're, you're familiar with Dan mm-hmm. Sherman? Yep. yep. Um, when I listened to Dan Sherman, and by the way, his book came out in the 90s, and again, this is one of these odd things. Oftentimes, I'm just given information at just the right time to share, uh, to, to learn something. You know, Dan says um, that the story he was told uh, by the gentleman in the CIA was that a program began in 1961 called Project Preserve Destiny. And that uh, he's 100% human, but that women were identified with a genetic predisposition. And in that genetic predisposition, um, uh, when the mother becomes pregnant, Late in the cycle of the pregnancy, the woman is abducted, and there is a genetic manipulation done in order to enhance an already existing uh, genetic makeup. And that predisposition, according to him, is, in, is, is to heighten a natural intuitiveness uh, to him. What's, what's interesting is that Colorado Springs has been, for many, many years, a hotbed of UFO activity, and that my mother was born there, grew up there. Um, was there during the vast majority of my uh, pregnancy. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly what any of this means, but my entire life I wanted to go into the Air Force, and I never understood why. And then to meet my mother 15 years later and find out that not only did my father uh, was my father in the Air Force, but when I listened to the Dan Sherman interview, and Dan says, uh, you know, I was listening to another one with uh, Carrie Cassidy, and she says, what's your, your genetic makeup? Um, I found it so interesting that he answers this, and this was the first kind of question that I asked um, my mother. He says, I'm English, uh, French, and uh, Cherokee. And as it turns out, I'm English, English, uh, French, uh, and Cherokee. And then my father's pure Norwegian, I guess. Uh, Blonde hair, blue eyes. You can see it in my daughter. Um, And and, and what's, what's most interesting, Mike, is that at my adoption, through my entire schooling career, I gotta tell you, I always felt like man, I just don't fit in here. And honestly, the teachers had no idea what to do with me. I mean, they would put me in for testing. I'd test high score, but I would never be able to function in the classrooms. I just didn't learn in that slow, circular, you know, form of education. What I learned is what what I've discovered over time now is I tend to take a subject and I can dig really, really deep on that passionate subject. And this is what's happened with this whole uh, ET UFO thing. Um, but you know, they had no idea what to do with me, nothing. And so uh, I go in the Air Force. Um, it's, it's not for me. I'm not a mechanical guy. I'm an emotional individual. Um, I, I have uh, a lot of uh, energy around telling stories. And uh, so I'm sitting at my desk back in uh, May of 2013, and I'm listening to one of the U- UFO videos that I follow. I think it was uh, – third phase of moon and they said oh don't forget to watch the citizens hearing on disclosure and mike i tell you i watched the whole thing um and there had been questions 
that had been plaguing me in my book about the crash that I could not answer. They didn't seem to fit in. Like, it made no sense. For example... Oh, oh, so, so this was just a year ago now. This is... That this was happening... Just... Wait a minute. So 2000... That happened in, in like... May of 2013. May of 2013. Yeah, yeah. So, so a little over a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, there were these things... For example, the Pope re- retired. Uh, Mike, Popes don't retire. It hasn't happened for 900 years or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, just it, this, yeah. Again, the thing, listen, this doesn't happen. Not only does, did the pope retire, but he was replaced by a Jesuit. We, we haven't had a Jesuit pope since we had the uh, the split in the first Vatican um, uh, schism. Uh, this is back in the 1500s. I mean, we're talking, you know, 500 plus years ago, 600 years ago, uh, that we had a. And, and even at that time, the the um, Three popes that there were, two of them resigned only because they wanted to end the schism and go back to a single pope. So why would a pope resign? This didn't make sense, and I'll get to that in a moment, what I've discovered. But it's just bizarre. So I'm sitting at my desk, and I, I Saturday morning I sat back down, and I, I went back through a number of the sessions of the citizens' hearing. And I went, you know, something clicked to me. And I, this is why, again, writing the book, why it was so important. Here we are. On May 5th, 2013, at, uh, what is that, 7.50 p.m., yep. I realized this whole thing, I, I stopped, I turned to my book, cracked it open, and this whole thing isn't about an economic collapse. But this whole thing is about disclosure. Okay, and, yep, is, I, you underlined is, so that's, yeah, I can see that. And it's, it's... Um, it's one of these uh, moments where w- what we're looking at, I think, in my mind is that um, it's this intuition that Dan speaks about, a highly intuitive uh, thing. You know, I, I've always been very intuitive about situations when I walk into them. I've always had a high level of intuition when I feel like I under- like someone is in a certain place or when I walk into um, – you know, a complicated sales, uh, for example. I just have this intuition of where it has to go and how we get there. It's And Dan says the same thing. I'm really good at making money. Look, I'm really good at sales. Um, and a lot of this comes from this intuition. I, I, I seem to come into understanding the solution to problems uh, fairly quickly um, and complicated issues at that, uh, connecting things that, that I can't explain in any other way um, uh, within this whole thing. So uh, this whole thing for me catalyzed on that uh, on that date on May 7th and we are now uh, 15 months later um, I think we're looking at the collapse itself and I think we're looking at disclosure and I want to talk about some of the things that I've discovered that are really interesting and kind of look at this from where it started mm-hmm. and, and get your perspective on some of these so okay. I've put a lot on the table are there any questions or things that you want to ask about before I jump into some other stuff no, this is very interesting. This is very interesting, and you're you're tapping into something that I've seen in a way where we spoke the other afternoon, and uh, you know, like this UFO thing is not a black and white thing. You know, I mean, I think yeah. there are people who have very strong experiences, who have had physical, powerful experiences. You know, literally being taken out of the bedroom, taken aboard the craft. I mean, I think those things exist and happen, and happen in a very physical place. And then I also think that there's a much more uh, ethereal consciousness aspect where people are being manipulated uh, in ways, you know, like when we move a piece on the chessboard, right? We reach down with our physical hand, we pick up that piece and we move it. And it feels more like, you know, some grand puppet master is looking down at the chessboard and instead of moving the pieces around with their, you know, meaty fingers, they're sort of putting an intuitive cloud. Yeah, it's, zapping it's the great. chessboards, and then the the pieces make they're the decisions like on themselves. Boat. They're blowing. It's like it's like they're blowing a boat across the water in certain directions, or or, or nudging a, a, a pool ball in a certain direction. Yes, or literally, you know, uh, putting a little, uh, let's say, a psychic download into the mind of the boatmaster, and says, "Well, I'm just going to turn the wheel like this a little bit." So. Yeah, exactly, uh, and and this yeah that's that's a great point, and and that's and that's what I think has been happening for not just me, but when I look out, you know, I had this interesting manifestation years ago, um, and I've had this happen a number of times throughout my life. Uh, and prior to the internet, this makes it more interesting because now if I have a question, I can just go on the internet and get it. But um, you know, throughout my life, I've had these moments where I've gone, 
man, what is this about? And then the information will simply be presented to me. I might come across a book or it might be an article in a magazine. Um, maybe it's a TV show, that uh, a news piece or a documentary that comes on that answers the question I literally just asked. Um, and this has happened throughout my life in different ways. Um, another one that was interesting about this uh, whole thing, you know, I was in my car. This is back in probably 93. Um, you know, I'd, I'd gone to see a psychiatrist uh, because I, I, I wanted to try and – why is Bob so different? And, you know, okay, hold on. 1993. Figure, so this is interesting. 1993, that's when I went to see a psychiatrist for the first time. So This would have probably been in spring, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it probably would have been in April, May of of ninety three. Okay, this I would actually later, have been I, in, in in December of ninety two, technically, when I when I went to the, you know, see this doctor. Anyway, keep going. Okay, and uh, I remember coming out and and being on my way home and just going, this guy doesn't get it. This isn't about some minor behavioral modification. This isn't. That's not what this is about at all. And I remember sitting there going, it's like the front of my brain just it doesn't work like everybody else's. And as people have learned more and more about ADD, which is another interesting manifestation here, um, and, they, and they've done the, uh, the scans, the active brain scans of people with ADD, what they found is that literally the front of the brain does not fire the same as everybody else. Uh, you know, I came on this uh, intuitively, if you will, again, uh, 10 years before it was ever discovered with um, uh, scans. Uh, on ADD, in fact, uh, this is another part of those things that I don't, under, you know, that's really odd. So when I finally met my birth family, um, I went from being the youngest of three that were adopted to the oldest of five. Uh, the other four children stayed with my mother, uh, or in and out of divorce. Oh, oh so you have, you have four siblings that you just okay? Four Are you, do you have any siblings. relationship with them, or? Uh, you know, actually, I have a great relationship with all of them. Uh, after we met my my uh, the oldest of the daughters. Uh, of my sisters, rather, um, we actually invited her to come live with us and be a nanny for our new daughter. She had a brand new son at the same age, and she stayed up here. We helped her clean up and straighten her life out, and um, she just lived in this very, you know, terrible level of dissonance in her life—a non-resonant life, if you will. And uh, it's funny. Ever since we all found each other, Mike, there has been even for my mother, who was a raging alcoholic, about eight years ago, finally cleaned up, and there is now just this. All of us have this level of harmony in our life that that's been very interesting since we all came back together wonderful well. okay good i just was curious that's great yeah, yeah. um and, and so um you know, this whole add thing to me it just seems like it didn't you know, so, so i've read pieces on this and, and they say oh add is already always existed we've got oh johnny couldn't sit in his seat in 2000 in, in 1903 this teacher wrote that oh they've got this uh piece back from, you know, uh, ancient Roman time, Greek times that says, you know, uh, Epiclus, uh, you know, he was such a wandering mind and couldn't focus. But I don't agree with that because with, within the paradigm of ADD, they talk about there being a high level of promiscuity. And if that were true, and this is genetic, we should see a gigantic, massive uh, population of people with ADD in our population by this time. And we don't. It should be like every third or fourth person. And I, that's just not what it is. I don't see that out in the population. Um, it seems to me that this begins somewhere around the 1950s or 1960s. Um, that is, you know, from a, a few cases, if you will, to many, um, you know, a growing number of individuals. And I don't know if this has to do with the whole um, ET abduction thing, but what it seems that he talks about, Dan Sherman talks about, it, it really relates to the idea of epigenetic DNA. Uh, epigenetic DNA being that in certain situations, DNA that was previously inert or inactive um, or dormant, if you will, uh, has become activated. And it uh, manifests different behaviors and characteristics in order to adjust to a different time that exists. Um, and so you're right. I mean, this could be like uh, manipulating people around by giving them these thoughts, not knowing like Dan Sherman said, I had no idea I had this skill. It was always there. I didn't recognize it. I didn't know what it was. I never thought I was anything special until they said, this is what you have. This is the, uh, this is the skill that was manipulated and given to you, and now we're going to enhance it and let you know what it is so that you have that open communication. And Dan even says that um, although there was a machine where he sat that, uh, part that, 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 that assisted in the communication, he did say in one of the interviews, that he was at his home when his uh, counterpart contacted him. 
So he doesn't need the machine in order to communicate anymore, which tells me that they probably don't need anybody to have a machine in order to push them in certain directions, to initiate certain thoughts and ideas. Does that does that resonate with you? Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, like, oops, I think that the needing the machine is, is you know... You know, that's there's like two levels of the research that's going on. There's the nuts and bolts researchers that want to have a metal spaceship that lands in the yard and leaves burn marks and you know has hinges on the door when it opens, and then there's a then there's but that's you know there's some evidence that that takes place certainly, but there's also all this other more ethereal stuff that is taking place that is that that is just uh, harder to quantify, and and the nuts and bolts researchers researchers are quick to ignore that just because it it isn't the it isn't the way they want to research something so yes no, i agree and sorry i dropped a I, I tried to make some notes here you know and what's interesting is that um there was a a uh how do i put this best there was an interesting development that began in the 1980s and i don't in tv really uh, and i don't know if you noticed this yourself but um you know, we've had brilliant people throughout history, but very smart. You know, Einstein was a very, very brilliant man. Um, you know, Tesla, Edison, all these individuals. But, you know, in the 1980s, I began seeing more and more. And this is one of those things where you just kind of see these things and intuitively go, there's something different about this. And there was a movie made in 1980. What year was that? I want to say 82, 83 with Gary Coleman. I don't know if you remember this. The kid with the genius IQ. No, I don't remember. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, what this was was about a kid who was, um, in 1983, um, who at uh, 11 or 12 was smart enough that he actually went off to college as a genius with a 200 IQ. We started seeing this manifestation of these kids in our population in the 1980s who had these IQs that were just off the charts. Absolutely off the charts. And it was one thing to have a few bright, brilliant people. But, you know, this was, in, uh, this was, I believe, part of the propaganda in order to normalize people into going, oh, yeah, this happens. Of course it happens. There was a movie about it. And this happens all the time. This doesn't happen all the time, Michael. Uh, if you look back through the records, I would doubt that you see constantly kids at you know, 12 or 13 who uh, are going to college uh, in, the, in, two, you know, in 1904 or 1912. It just didn't happen. And uh, this was, I think, something that manifested itself beginning in the 1970s and early 80s. And so you have to put a kibosh on that by creating the propaganda of, of course, this is normal. Look, we got movies about it. You know, kids always do this. And yeah, I'm sure there was events throughout history where that would show up. But I do sense that there has been a curious uptick in and it has been it's kind of been documented and whispered about i haven't really heard anything in the mainstream talking about it it certainly shows up in this little little thing here and, and i remember uh, what's his name uh roger lear spoke about it where there's long there's been ongoing research like when a little when children can play patty cake and very simple things like that you know and those statistics have changed over the last 50 years and, yes yeah so and i mean it just seems like there's a there's an upswing in the uh intelligence and i would have to think that there's been so that the, the implication is that Something's going on. Well, and what's what's really interesting then too is when I looked at um, some of the people who participated in the citizens' hearing, and in particular, uh, two individuals, um, Richard Dolan, and I know you interviewed Richard. It was a brilliant interview, by the way, and uh, Daniel Sheehan. And while Sheehan's birthday um, actually falls outside of um, what Dan Sherman lists as the um, and, as the start time. And what is, does he have a start time? Because this is interesting. Cause it, I, um, Richard Dolan's birthday is... Uh, he's 1962. He's born in 1962. Yeah, so was so I. I he's he's about day. 50 days older than I am, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting is when, you, when I went through his history, he went through... He went to some of the most interesting schools. He Rich. went to a school... Yeah, Rich did. Um, he went to a school called Alfred University, and, Al, and it's named after, they believe, Alfred the Great. And Alfred the Great um, was uh, – oh, this is really interesting too. So it says here – so I'm going to follow this rabbit down the hole, all right? So this is Alfred the Great, and I've got a, a picture of Alfred the Great here on my – you know, because you've got to see Alfred the Great. Okay, right? okay. 
And uh, uh, it says, I'm just going to call him Alf. If that's not, you know, if that doesn't sound too weird, it's a mini Alf movie, if you will. Um, anyway, he, Alf, Alf, uh, Alfred the Great stopped the Vikings from pillaging and brutalizing the island nation, and he became the king of the Anglo-Saxons. So when we look at where we are today politically and the movement and the growth of the Libertarian Party, it, all of this is based on common law, all of which goes back to Anglo-Saxon law. You know, it's this it, just another odd synchronicity mm-hmm. that he that you know that this happened. And in particular, at the citizens' hearing, the individual who moderated this hearing. Did you watch the citizens' hearing? I've seen bits and pieces of it, and kind of I just have watched the YouTube videos randomly, and I'm very familiar with most of the folks that spoke. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, so what was interesting is that obviously there were six former members of Congress that sat on it, three Democrats, three Republicans, three women, three men, you know, uh, five congressmen and a senator. But what was most interesting to me was that the individual who moderated this was Joe Buckman, who happened at the time to be the um, chair of the platform committee for the Libertarian Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, another odd, uh, you know, another, I, I don't know if I call it odd, but it, it turns out that uh, he and Stephen Bassett are good friends, and uh, Joe actually helped to arrange and helped them to find the uh, panelists to sit on that. Uh, one of the interviews, Car- again, Carrie Cassidy did, um, showed up and said, uh, yeah, about a month and a half out, Stephen was like, I, I can't get anybody to say they'll come do this. And so Joe got involved and, and helped him to put these, uh, these speakers together. Um, the other one that I thought was just so interesting was um, uh, was uh, Daniel Sheehan. Uh, this is just another extraordinary, extraordinary man. I've uh, met him very briefly. Yeah, I've yeah, seen really. him speak a few times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've listened to everything that I have, and so I'm going to use this as a transition because he answered some very early and interesting parts about this entire phenomenon. That um, in my research, I think I've got this right, but this brings together about eight things I've talked about so far into one point of of reference, <clears throat> and I'll uh, I'll jump to that book right now. So, in this would have been is this the right one? No. Here we go. I. Uh, I started writing that this was about uh, disclosure uh, back in uh, the May area, and then I started doing more and more and more of my research, and then I finally started getting into some deeper stuff and asking myself, so what can I put down on paper that is outright as provable as we can get? You know, obviously there's all sorts of things you can't say for sure, but if you connected enough dots and made as few assumptions as possible, uh, these might make sense. So we begin with uh, Roswell, which... If you listen to the interviews of the individual who wrote the press release, you know he says, "Look, the colonel comes in and tells you to write a press release that uh, we caught a UFO saucer." Uh, you don't change that wording very much, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. You, you correct some commas, you put in some different, you know, but you, you pretty much write what they tell you. So, uh, you know, if we begin at that point that Roswell happened, then you begin with Truman and the Majestic Twelve. That much we've got is a solid construct around this. Um, I, I tend to believe, and I think it's true when you think about it, that um, what we really found was actually a plant. I think that the aliens, and I think these are program life forms, and they said if we landed, uh, we would not be trusted. If we tried to make communication, um, we don't think that they would be honest with us, and, and, and there still wouldn't be this level of trust. What, we, what they have to have is they have to get their hands on something that they can tangibly go through and say, what does this represent? And so they use programmable life forms. Uh, you know, I, you know, we're still using mechanical. Uh, they realize you just grow it, and, um, and that makes a lot more sense. Uh, you grow it, and, you can, and if you understand the whole uh, quantum nature of telepathy, it isn't, as uh, Dan Sherman points out, it, clearly it's not about how close you are in proximity to whatever entity you're communicating with. They could have been on the moon base or wherever this base would be or on a space station someplace and, you know, crashed this thing in New Mexico uh, and begun a process that is fairly predictable. Um, someone's going to find it. A little bit of the information will get out. They'll shut it up. But then we at least have everybody on the same page of knowing when this whole you know phenomenon really began with the government. Um, and uh, so... 
as you know, this is also when the uh, NSA began, as well as the CIA. Mm-hmm. All in 1947, right? yes, yes. Yeah. Which is, wait, it's interesting, because I also, I mean, it also is a, oh, there's a bunch of things that happened in 1947, including the height of the Cold War. So so there's lots of, uh, someone just wrote a book recently, I can't remember the author, it was a woman. Uh, she wrote a book on the uh, secrecy program and how it evolved with the uh, uh nuclear our, our nuclear bombs you know like in mm-hmm. the, right after world war 2 and it's very interesting reading for, with a, with ufo eyes in a way because it very much parallels the the secrecy concerns with the ufo thing so anyway keep going yeah yeah no absolutely so then we get to this interesting thing and i have you seen the cia um interview at the end of the citizen hearing that richard dolan did no, who does he interview? Oh, he interviews the old fellow with the in, in I think it's in Wisconsin. Uh, it's in actually Minnesota. Okay. I've actually stayed. At, I think I, I, if it's the hotel that I think it is, I think I've actually stayed in that hotel. Uh, it's right off the main road when you get there, and I I couldn't believe when I saw him go in and I saw this, you know, Park Falls, uh, and I was like, that's exactly that's where the CIA has Minnesota. their 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 microphones already hooked up. I guess okay. Yeah, it was interesting. So, you know, what, I, what, I've, what I've come together to, to see at this whole thing is a lot of this began um, with that video. A lot of these things, you know, you've got Eisenhower in uh, 1958, according to this gentleman, who could not get any information on what was going on. If the fellow's um, to be believed, yeah, but keep going. If yeah. the fellow's, yeah, if the fellow's to it's be believed. It's a great story. It's a great story. Yeah, exactly. Now, this is one of those things where we, we get this little circle is all the way back to the Pope. Um, resigning. So you've got here, obviously, you've got uh, four individuals, um, John F. Kennedy, uh, the two Dulles brothers. But do you know who this gentleman is? Are, are uh, it's hard for me to see that? here, but yeah, it's some sort of someone in a, in a, in a is it, uh, I, I wouldn't know, it's someone in a, in a Catholic Roman outfit, yeah. yeah. Uh, this would be Avery Dulles. Oh, uh, oh Avery oh. Dulles okay. is the son of, uh, is he the son of uh, Foster Dulles, John okay. Foster Dulles. This was, uh, this was Eisenhower's Secretary of State. Mm-hmm. And then his brother over here was the first, uh, one of the first. I think he was the second or third head of the CIA, the longest running head of the CIA. Uh, not only that, but he served on the Warren Commission when John F. Kennedy yep. was oh, assassinated. Yep. Um, which and was fired. Was really and his brother was mayor of Dallas or something like that? No, no, that's some, someone else was okay. Uh, this, this, that still may come into it somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so what's interesting is that uh, there was one of those documents that come out and you go, wow, is this, you know, a real document is that, you know, are, are they telling the truth? But I thought this was so interesting that came out just prior to about a three weeks before um, Kennedy was assassinated. And if this document's to be believed, Kennedy was asking about uh, the Majestic 12 and all that. If Eisenhower did get concerned, was concerned about uh, the whole UFO phenomenon being kept out of his hands, he would have made sure that Kennedy had as much information as possible uh, coming into office. And so I will Kennedy's also surprised. add that, that um, uh, it's I, this is just the stuff I hear, you know, and it's like I've not done the research myself. But uh, Kennedy, naval officer in World War II, uh, a young senator, was on uh, several uh, like him, like committees that you know that where he would have had a very high clearance. And it's my understanding. So that so the thought is that, uh, and there's some documentation there where he mentioned certain things well before becoming president about like having what would be insider knowledge to the to the UFO reality. Yes, yeah, and that's and that's uh, very interesting. In fact, the only other person who has as much involvement uh, in this as, as uh, the Dulleses uh, are these three men right here. Yep. Uh, yeah. The, 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 uh, the whole Bush clan, uh, beginning with Prescott Bush, who uh, would have headed the sci- uh, the um, committee in Congress uh, that would have been um, deeply involved with the whole question of uh, the CIA's involvement or the NSA's involvement in this. Um, I just think it's so interesting that the Bushes have maintained, obviously, George W. being part of the CIA in the 60s through the 70s through Carter, um, again, taking over in 1980 under Bush. Uh, as well as vice president, as vice president anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. but being but being brought back into that that fold um, through ninety two, and uh, and president and Reagan getting shot within twelve months of the election, yeah, so. yeah, ex- it, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, more of this odd odd stuff. But going back to um, 
this guy, Avery Dallas. So what this is really interesting. Um, in 2008, I remember I was driving because I used to travel a bit in my quite a bit in my car, and uh, I'd always listen to talk radio and catch the news. And in 2008, the Pope had come to America. Uh, visiting America for popes is actually a, a bit rare. It only happens once every couple of years, if that. But the Pope had come to America. It spent some time with George Bush, and I thought the whole thing. This is Pope Francis, the previous Pope, the one who retired. And he'd come to America, and then within like a month of that, and I went back and I researched this, it was on May 17th, the Pope actually came out and said it is possible for aliens to exist. Yep. Um, Yeah, and uh, this happened shortly after that. So at the time I heard this, I thought, well, he met with the president. Of course, this is what the president told him. But then I came through in my research something very, very interesting. The Pope came to America and gave Avery Dulles on his deathbed, a private face-to-face meeting at his home in Virginia and took his personal comments at that meeting. In other words, Avery Dulles, the son of John Foster Dulles, uh, it, was, it was either John or it was uh, Alan, but I think it was John, um, one of the top heads of the Vatican uh, working at the, he worked at the Vatican for a number of years, very high up. As it, By the way, did I mention he's a Jesuit? No, but okay. I'm not. I don't follow the the, the machinations of the of like the hierarchy of so, the Catholic Church, but but I know that there's this. You know, the, the Jesuits, Jesuits are the science arm and the and the uh, the um, academic arm of the Catholic Church. So the Vatican Observatory um, is staffed by the Jesuits. And it, when when I did my research on the Jesuits, what's really interesting is uh, Michael that they aren't really just about praying. They're about meditation and consciousness. Uh, and again, this happened back in the 15th century with um, uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Loyola. Mm-hmm. Of, uh, it's in the book here again. Um, in any case, he went to the he had a, he got a, he got uh, wounded in war, and he had what would probably, at best guess, be a near death experience. Then came back to the Pope and said, "I need to start this new order of priests." And the Pope said, "Okay." When was you know, this? This was in the 15th century. Okay, okay. Um, I want to say 1511. You can look it up. I wouldn't know, but okay, great. St. Ignatius of of Loyola is who it was. And so uh, this is the science arm who focuses on consciousness, which is actually the big problem that the Catholic Church or that religion is going to have with ET exposure is the the consciousness side. We can talk about that if you'd like, because this has a lot to do with the abduction. It has a whole lot to do with... Are, are you know the idea that we're being directed in certain in certain ways uh, through that and such? But I found this odd reference. So the Pope comes back in 2008, and then in 2013 he retires. And at the time he really didn't say why he retired. But in uh, in subsequent interviews, much later, it comes out the Pope said that he retired because he had, and I quote, a mystical experience. Uh, God told him he should retire. I, I don't know. You know what do you do, Mike? This is this is being this is printed and coming out of the Vatican news. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's very strange. Very strange. Yeah. V- very strange. And then to have uh, the new pope be a, 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 a Jesuit on top of that, uh, and he has been on an absolute breakneck pace of uh, cleaning up the Vatican and of changing the perception of uh, how we should live and, and, and such. Uh, did you see, I don't know if you, you probably haven't noticed this, he excommunicated the Italian mafia. I did not notice that. No, I have never heard of that. So, But that that that's very interesting. And it doesn't, because um, there's this kind of, uh, you know, conspiratorial rumor mill that the, that the Vatican itself and the Italian mafia are, completely intermeshed in some he also way. Fired, he also fired four of the five heads of the Vatican Bank, all of which were Italian, and replaced them with international players. Again, you got to clean up the house before you expose all the players. Yep. Right? Um, this spring, uh, unprecedented, he invited uh, Shimon Perez and Mahmoud Abbas to come to the Vatican and the three of them had a hug fest. Uh, and it wasn't just those three, though. Those three were the three that were um, featured. All major religions 
uh, were invited to this mass uh, and meeting uh, at the Vatican earlier this year, mm-hmm. which, which, by the way, happened shortly after President Obama went and had a 50-minute meeting at the Vatican with the Pope. And he left there, and he flew to Saudi Arabia and had another 50-minute meeting with um, King Assad, the, not, not the son king prince, but the king king prince, uh, king king Assad, the, the father. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as, as you line these all up, you've, you've got to get certain people in line of what's going to happen next. And it just, you know, what's in these background, what is actually occurring, I don't know. But none of these make any sense unless you go... If we're going to have disclosure, we've got to get certain people like the Pope on board. You've got to get the head of, well, I mean, Mecca's in, in, in Saudi Arabia. You've got to get King uh, Assad, uh, re, you know, roped in and understanding this. And, um, and then it isn't just those two religions. The most unique thing happened again about three months ago. Uh, the Dalai Lama. The, the the Lama himself said, uh, you know what, I might retire. The Pope just retired, and the second Pope's talking about retiring, so I think I'm going to retire maybe, and you know what, we don't need another Dalai Lama after me. Like, why would not only a Pope retire, but a second Pope talk about retiring, and the Dalai Lama say, eh, I'm the last Lama, we won't need another Lama after me. None of this makes sense, unless disclosure's coming, and it's going to change the perception or reality around religion if you will. Mm-hmm. And, okay, keep going, because I just think there's, the, what was it, there was that point when, you know, literally, like on CNN, the, the uh, I can't remember which Pope it was, it was, I think it was, uh, you know, they were talking about, uh, they'd have representatives from the Vatican kind of just, you know, talking heads saying, yeah, you know, the, you know if there is, uh, you know, we feel like if there is a, a, alien life, you know, that it would be, you know, created by God and they would be our brethren and, and that we, you know, that kind of thing. I just remember that was, that was straight up mainstream news that, that got, that got full play on, on CNN and, and the, yeah, so. And it's funny you bring up CNN and, you know, and these types of organizations. M- M- MSNBC is another one. Uh, if you look at this deeply, not only did it from, from a control standpoint of the propaganda, um, controlling the media on major networks like NBC would be easy if they're already involved in the black projects through GE aircraft or through, G, you know, they've got, I worked for GE for a while. This company is massive mm-hmm. and they have a lot of military contracts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you were to go to Jack Welch or whoever, the, whoever was the CEO before Jack Welch and say, hey, um, boy, it really just got sunny outside, didn't it? Um, you know, you go to Jack Walsh, hey, listen, we need you to do this and then bring these people in, and then you're able to control who you bring up through the ranks of that organization to control the media output. What I discovered is that if you want a litmus test of independent journalists, the question is really UFOs and ETs. Um, when the citizen hearing occurred, one of my pieces of research was, you know, has anybody else covered this? And they actually had a, uh, they actually had a piece on... MSNBC in, uh, where did I put that? Here we go. A piece on NBC, MS, excuse me, on MSNBC, uh, Rachel Maddow mm-hmm. was on. And Rachel Maddow did a piece on the citizens hearing. This would have been April, I want to say 2nd or 12th. It was about a month before. And it was so interesting, Mike. Um, I actually went and downloaded the transcript itself. It's in the book. She called this a fake hearing on fake UFOs and use the word fake 15 times, including, and this is the one that really caught me saying, and this is going to be a a hearing on fake. uh, This is a fake UFOs hearing, a fake UFOs hearing. This wasn't a fake hearing on UFOs. This was a fake UFOs hearing. In other words, she called the UFOs fake um, outright on her show. Now, why would you do that? Well, you, you need to get that part of the population that might follow this type of, a, you know, might, might be interested or open to, to these kind of ideas uh, to ignore it. You can't pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, this is part of that machine of propaganda. So I've identified that Rachel Maddow is part of the machine um, of propaganda uh, through and through uh, by this. And this is one of those things that was really interesting about that. So... Um, what else have I have I got here? I, I've got so much material um, that have come up. Uh, what's so this has continued to develop over the last year. In December, uh, 
there was a hearing in Congress at the Library of Congress. Did you hear about this hearing on astrobiology? Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it so was is, it was like uh, you know taking in the data from, uh, yeah, it was like talking about like uh, amino acids in in the surface of Mars and things like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this was just a very basic baseline. You know, what are the chances? And it and it used it had uh, two scientists, well three actually, but the third one. This is really interesting. Was um, Michael, um, Michael. Where's my book for this time of year? Uh, this would have been back last year. Um, here we go. Well, I'll I'll skip I'll skip his name. I'll I'll find out as I'm talking. Uh, this gentleman is was the head of the NASA Library of Congress. Um, uh, Astrobiology Institute. Uh, we actually took a, in, in the in the nineteen nineties, nineteen ninety eight, I believe it is. They created a NASA Astrobiology Institute. That in two thousand eleven, either it was an act of Congress or something happened. It was moved from NASA, which, as you know, is a non a non governmental agency. Mm -hmm. It was moved from NASA into the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress actually has an institute for astrobiology now, part of it, and. Um, the, there was one gentleman who was the uh, head of that first, and then um, this other gentleman began in 2012 or 13 in 2012 to 2013 to be the head of the of the Astrobiology Institute. We're under the we're coming up on our third uh, person for this, and not only did they hold a hearing on on this in December of 2012 or 2013, they just held another one on. Um, Astrobiology, and this one had Seth Shostak from SETI mm -hmm, speak sure, at it yep. as well, uh, as, other, as well as another gentleman, um, which was really, really interesting. And then again, they held a two-day symposium just a couple of months ago um, on, uh, on just the exact same thing, the implications of extraterrestrial life in our universe. Uh, it was a two-day symposium that had some uh, remarkable speakers. Here we go. Had some remarkable speakers um, on just a variety of issues. I want to read you just a couple of these that, um, you know, if you were preparing for disclosure and you wanted to have something for uh, the congressman, you wanted to have something for the senators to go read and listen to that was already part of the of it, uh, these are some of the, um, the speakers. You had, uh, here it is, Stephen Dick. Uh, the NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. He spoke on current approaches to finding life beyond Earth. You had um, Stephen Dick, uh, again, spoke on history, discovery, and analogy, um, the philosophy of astrobiology by another gentleman, uh, the landscape of life by Dick Schulz uh, Muchik from Washington State University, the landscape of intelligence by uh, Lori Marino. This was really interesting. She talked about how um, other species may may think how their perception of reality may be very different from ours, which is really kind of the idea that we see of, you know, boy, people are being abducted, and, and this is, can be very traumatic for people. You know, they may see the world very differently than we do. Um, they may have a different understanding. Um, equating culture, civilization, and moral development in imagining ETI, anthrop anthrop uh, anthropogenic, uh, assumptions. Uh, John uh, Tapkin of uh, University of Texas, Austin. They had a gentleman from the uh, uh, Vatican Observatory, um, Don Cosimilingo. Uh, I'm terrible with names, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, he did a. Uh, he spoke on um, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? That that showed up when the, the when the uh, that was like one of the pat questions that got asked in all those MSNBC kind of. Things when the Vatican came out with, uh, you know, they're like, you know, we are open to the idea of extraterrestrial life. So. Yeah, uh, astrobiology and theology. Robin Lovin for the Center of Theology uh, of Theological Inquiry at Princeton, New Jersey, um, and uh, all of these just kept. Uh, it's just it's startling the amount of official government um, information that is beginning to be to put into the record on disclosure. So you had the citizens' hearing last year. 
you had a hearing in December of 2013, another hearing, I believe, was in uh, May of 2014. You had a two-day symposium in September of 2014. And on the day before the election, Stephen Bassett uh, mailed out the uh, DVDs on the citizens' hearing for for disclosure. Mm -hmm. Uh, These guys will never be further from an election. There will never be more information sitting in the Library of Congress uh, and more things pointing at this. And in my theory, this is all about disclosure. Uh, you know, throughout history, and I read this, this is something I read, you know, before, is they say, uh, you know, is it possible that this will collapse, the economy will collapse, and things will change? Absolutely. The only difference now versus every civilization before now uh, is that uh, the pieces are bigger. The pieces that will get picked up and somebody will pick them up are bigger now than they've ever been. Pieces of, well, like, the shattered, shattered world structure. The, yeah, the shattered world structure, the the you know the the military industrial complex, the uh, industries of government, the industries of uh, society, mm-hmm. all you know the, the pieces are just bigger. Yep. Uh, this has happened before, but the reason I think that these two really come together is best equated with this with this idea. Mike, do you think that the government, first of all, would be dumb enough to not know that a collapse was coming, and then second enough, be dumb enough to let it happen and risk the information? falling out of their hands. And I just think that's, I I don't buy that assumption. I I don't think there's any way they would let that big of a risk go uh, without a plan. And that's where you get the the sort of, uh, what's his name, Uh, Stephen Jones thing with, uh, um, you know, the FEMA camps, you know, being built all over the country and there's this there's a you know why do why why are uh, cops being highly militarized in the last decade you know there's all these little things that would you know feed the paranoia you know and so so i can't speak directly to whether you know this is the disclosure now it's very interesting where you know you say you use the word disclosure implying that it's the that's the uh announcement that there's you know basically ufos are real and they're here and they're visiting us and it right. may be more I mean, quite honestly, it may be more bizarre than that, you know, the, the, the news that gets that gets released. So but but I think that's that would be potentially a part of it, you know. So how to say this, like I you know, like I'm following your thing, but I you know, so if you watch a movie, right? And you know, yeah. someone's walking down a hall, is like a dark street, you know, and he's walking slow and they cut to his eyes looking around and they play spooky music, you know that something's like you know, ominous right. <laughs> looming ahead, right? So, so you've just you've just outlined all this stuff, and and I'm and I feel like I'm doing it in a way. Like this is like I have no proof of anything like that, but I just feel like I'm walking through life where I'm where I just feel like that ominous music is playing, and whatever is on the 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 horizon line of of our time. I just feel I just I get the sense that something's up. Something bad is not bad. Let's say dramatic. Bad implies something dramatic is on the horizon line. Well, and what's interesting is you bring up the FEMA camps uh, again. I mean, all this research. So before I knew that this believe before I came to the the, the conclusion that this was about disclosure, um, there was a manual, a FEMA manual that was just that was uh, re- was leaked. Are you familiar with this? No, but keep going. Yeah. So um, a FEMA man was, manual was released that said, "This is how we will. This is how these get run. This is what you guys will do. These are the constructs and these are the procedures and what you should do." Da da da. And in there was a reference for one th- uh, some of the things that they'll do, which include work release. And the idea of work release um, is that we'll need to normalize people to put them back into society. And it literally says that one of the jobs in these FEMA camps is going to be, are you ready for this, indoctrination. What, indoctrination into what? You know, like, I mean, does that mean they, they put you on, I mean, is that like some scene out of Clockwork Orange, or is that some, you know, like, you know, exactly, or is that like <laughs> a, some like summer it, camp thing where they say, okay, you know, we're like, yeah, so. Well, and but the interesting part is the, the only other place that I've heard indoctrination used so, so, so consistently is from leakers in the UFO ET phenomenon. Um, in particular, Bob Lazar says this, that uh, part of his training to work at, at S4 was that he was to go into a room and he, there was a box of materials that he was, you know, with files. You go in and you open them up. And he says, and part of the job in order to be able to open myself up to possibilities was that I had to be indoctrinated. They had to indoctrinate me into the reality of UFOs, ETs, and extraterrestrial contact. Um, which is a really interesting corollary. Uh, I think that, you know, from a 
collapse standpoint, the FEMA cast will be a collection point for people who will um, want to revolt, if you will, rebel. Absolutely. I, I think there's because part of this they say is, you know, you got to watch out for um, insurrection within these camps. But at the same time, uh, this whole indoctrination thing tells me, and if you think about this, I think we both agree based on the um, uh, based on Orwell's experience, the, you know, from the, from the 30s, uh, people are going to freak out. People are going to freak out and they're going to take off. And it's, this is really, really weird. But in May of this year, uh, and again, this is in the book here, in May of this year, uh, they actually ran a drill on Madeline Island in northern Wisconsin. Blackhawk helicopters, police, uh, army flew in and practiced as if they were going to go in and capture a prepper camp here in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. They practiced it. I, I think that the FEMA camps are about people freaking out. And these aren't, these aren't coffins. These are storage bins for the people's goods. Uh, people are going to grab anything of value, and they're going to head for the hills. Mm -hmm. They're going to think we're in the middle of a, a UFO invasion that the government has been taking over. Yep. I mean, I, it's hard to know how the future is going to be played out. My sense is that, that, that if, you know, how, like – The government ain't gonna say nothing. I mean, there's three. There's three. There's three. There's one guy. This guy named Ron Regeres, this UFO researcher. He had this nice analogy. He's an old, soft-spoken Western country guy. He says, you know, the, you sit on a milk stool. You know, you milk the cow, and you have a little stool. It's got three legs. It stands up perfectly. You got three legs. Stands up perfectly. And you got one that's the government. It's not saying anything. You got two. You got the UFO occupants. They're not coming out they're not landing on the white house lawn they're just kind of perfectly you know flitting at the edges and you got three the third leg is that that like the general population does not want to know at a core level they are they are like you know you try i mean you obviously know just what it means so you bring this up at a party and whoosh, people gloss oh. over yeah so do not want to talk about the subject <clears throat> do not want to address it do not want to think about it do not want to put it in there you know it's not it's out of their sphere of consciousness and it ain't going to get plugged in so unless it's but that those same people are watching you know the x-files reruns on you know cable tv so yeah so this is one of those interesting things about that moment so within my research that w one of the things that's come up have you watched the uh documentary called the skull project no skull s s-c-o-l-e the skull project okay. so what's really interesting about the skull project is that it was about um these this group of individuals in England, uh, psychics, um, well-known psychics, uh, been psychics their whole life. And uh, what they did was they painted the basement of a room in a house in Skull, England, uh, dark black. Black as black as black as black gets. All right. And then uh, they, they sat down in the room. They said, you know, we did this probably, you know, two, three, four hours a day, three, four times a week. They said, we did this for about nine months and nothing happened. You know, nothing really popped up. And what were they doing? Popped they... Up. They, were, they, were, they were meditating and, and trying to communicate with, uh, uh, well, the other side. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, what, what they eventually begin to manifest, Mike, is – and they've got it on film. They've got audio. They've got um, they've got uh, film. Uh, one of the things that once they began making communication, they were told to do is take some film, put it into a camera, and just set the camera on the table. So the next time they got there, they all sat down, they meditate, they get into the trance, whatever that you know, whatever this deep level is, and they say, and then we hear the camera floating around the room, clicking, and they went and developed the pictures, the the, the film, Mike, and. There are pictures on the film. Now, okay, Bob, you, you can't accept too much. Well, you know, in the documentary, they take you through the uh, the different people who came in to try and make sure, look, that this, this isn't chicanery. This isn't trickery. They brought in a magician. They brought in uh, – there's an organization in Britain that uh, specifically works to confirm or debunk these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they came out of this and they said, yeah, look, <laughs> there's this, this is happening. What's really interesting, this just came up, and I've got this in my book here. This will be easy for me to find. What's interesting is that um, one of the things that they were also eventually given on a film, so eventually they moved from not using the camera at all. Uh, eventually they were said, look, just put, the, just put the film on the table. We think we can manipulate the film just 
even by itself. And um, so they put the film on the table, and in one of these, and this is a technical drawing of it. This isn't the actual drawing. Uh, the actual drawing is available online, though. They, they came along, and there was this image of a schematic to create a germanium oscillator. Now, what's interesting about germanium is that germanium is the element right between silicon and right between metal. It is a metal, but the atoms can be arranged like a crystal. It is a non-naturally occurring element. It's found in plants, but it does not occur. You, you can't go out and mine germanium. It just doesn't exist. Um, they made this thing, and all of a sudden, the, oh, here's the picture of, the, of, of this was on the film. This was on the actual film that they developed. Oh, interesting. Far out. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then they drew the schematic from that. And so, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a guy, Boyd Bushman, mm -hmm. just yep. came out with this, okay, uh, in this, this whole thing. I don't know if you noticed this, but he pointed down here to this image right here. You know what this is made of? You know what he said the UFOs used to be made of? Ger germanium? Yeah, germa germanium. Okay. Uh, which is really interesting. Uh, one of... Um, Stephen Greer's interviews that he's done uh, on his Serious Disclosure channel was the gentleman who, who did the, um, who says that, ooh. Uh oh No, just the neighbor coming. Sorry about that. Um, was the gentleman who he said, who said that he created the, uh, the, um, dogs throw me off here, uh, flight simulator for the UFO. I don't know if you, have you seen this one? And, you know, it's interesting when he talks about it. Uh, and he's, he's probably in his early six, late 60s, early 70s when he did this. He probably did this, you know, 10 years ago before he died. Oh, goodness. Um, I do not know why they are still barking. There's nobody outside. Okay. This is odd. Um, so uh, in this, what they did was they, 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 uh, they created this machine, this, this oscillator that increased and improved their ability to have this whole communication. Um, oh, so then this os when, when they was interviewing this guy who created this flight simulator for these uh, pilots, you know, he, he was asked the question, something to the effect of, you know, could anybody go on the ship? And he gets this look on his face like and he and he says, yeah, with some training so that you'd be able to do it. And you just get this idea like when you're inside of these crafts uh, that are made of germanium, highly charged with electromagnetism. Something just tells me you can see a whole different level of reality around you in those crafts at that time. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. It was really bizarre when he said that. All of these things are, again, lining up of, you know, potentially what is there? I don't know. But in the Skull Project, um, late, later on, they begin working with video. And so what they do is they have the camera pointed at a mirror, points at a mirror, points at a mirror, and then looks into the um, viewfinder of the video camera. Okay, and of the images that come up, guess what? One of the images is they get eventually a picture of a gray. Unbelievable! Uh, they've got it on tape. There, it's a picture of a gray. It's, it comes up at the end of the at the end of the uh, documentary. And this this skull project took place in the sixties or something when it was early seventies. No, 70s? no, no, no. Like no, like like five years ago. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, very, very modern, very recent. Okay, the um. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So, so this led me down looking into uh, quantum mechanics, quantum consciousness. Well, actually, it led me to, to, look, to look into uh, Rupert Sheldrake. This is when I came across Rupert Sheldrake and his material, which then, of course, led me into the whole quantum mechanics and everything. And, uh, you know, again, so this is kind of back, this is back to the idea of this being about disclosure. Have you have you had an Amber Alert go off? And do you use a smartphone? Are you like me? Are you on to? No, I'm not, I don't have a smartphone, and, and uh, no, I never. So yeah, I have. Yeah. I've got every other digital advice thing. So but I just don't have a smartphone yet. So there'll be a day. But okay, it hasn't happened there'll yet. Be, so. There'll be a day. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was. Um, I'm addicted Marcus, enough to things. I don't need to add one more addiction <laughs> to my to my arsenal of like things right. that are going to addict me. So yeah. Yeah. No, I know how that goes. Um, I was I was in in March. I was in Colorado Springs visiting my family. My wife and the family went out there and uh, spent uh, uh, spring break. It was really windy on the way out. There were dust storms. We drove out, but it was really odd. We were sitting at my brother's house, 
and we were having dinner. This is right around, um, it might have been the day before St. Patrick's Day. It might have been the day of St. Patrick's Day. And we're sitting at the table, and all of a sudden, my phone goes off. Uh, and it's alert. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an emergency alert. It's a high wind um, emergency warning system was alerting my phone that there was a dust storm coming into Colorado Springs. Now, I'm from Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm, I'm, this isn't, you know, if it's sending out the message based on, uh, uh, based on uh, area code on your phone number, it, it, it's clearly not that. This thing can actually send messages out into a phone. I bet you could probably turn a phone on. We know the technology exists for the CIA and NSA to do that. Not only did my phone go off, but all of a sudden everybody's phone in the room starts going off. Everybody is now attached in America with a smartphone is attached to this national alert system that can be localized as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see where you're going. Yep. And so this so could, that, in- that, this stuff could no. So my concern is with with disclosure is who knows what it you know like whatever's going to go on the 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 power brokers are going to play it. They're going to spin it to their advantage, and they have their their ability for mass manipulation. Uh, is highly sophisticated. So keep going. I know where you're going with this. I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, it, it can be from the spin side, but what's important to this whole picture is when I got into quantum mechanics and quantum uh, uh, entanglement, why you have to do this all at once as part of the collapse is, you know, what I think will happen is that you'll see the market seize up, whatever else might happen, and there's so many things. I mean, the, the number of dysfunctional things happening globally uh, Japan is about to hit hyperinflation. You've got massive deflation occurring in Europe. Uh, you've got uh, the ruble is, is deflating. Um, and, and, of course, we're in conflict in, in the Ukraine. Uh, you know, all sorts of things. But what quantum mechanics says, and what Rupert Sheldrake shows, is that you know, you've got this moment of the hundredth monkey, if you will, right? Like at, at a certain point when enough people get this idea, enough whatever it is, um, you have this – Everybody gets it, or you know what I mean. Are you sure, familiar sure. With this we, word? Yeah, yeah. And he does it as, yeah. with like exercises as simple as uh, if if the uh, <clears throat> he's done. So the crossword puzzle on Sunday comes out on the Sunday London Times. People said yes. to do this crossword puzzle. If you wait a day and do the same crossword puzzle on Monday, you statistically get people doing much better, much faster, much higher accuracy doing it on Monday rather than on Sunday. And his thought is that the, the intuitive cloud, not the intuitive, like the, like the actual, the, the power of someone thinking, focusing on the crossword puzzle is there the in the ether of, of London. So when you do it on Monday, you just pick up the answers that much quicker. That's a very simple like, you know, example. Yep. Exactly. So now we all have an emergency alert system. The president is going to make an announcement. And in that vacuum of that, everybody going, ah, oh, what's, what's happening? My, my bank account's frozen. What, ah, the president will make an announcement at it. If the president, if the world, whatever the world leaders are, can make this as positive a moment as possible, make it as jointly understood a moment as possible, that quantum entanglement of consciousness will spread going forward and we will have fewer issues. And if you can think of a better way to get everybody's attention at once than to collapse the economy globally against the world's reserve currency, I'm all ears. So, you know, I think – I mean the other way to do is, it is to, to, to say that, you know, video footage of flying saucers hovering over Washington, D.C. Yeah. But anyway, keep going. Yeah. But, but then you, but if you do that, you've got the concern of an attack. Yeah. And we're under invasion. Remember, we've got to make it positive. A positive engagement in this and a positive start to disclosure – is uh, is the key from a quantum entanglement standpoint. If you and I have a positive experience, this is this is so so this is sort of going into the question of why all the abductees, why change people's consciousness, why create this intuitive, um, you know, sensation. If if we've been manipulated, we being the population of America, the population of the world, as we know, the abduction phenomenon is global. What if you created as many people who had as as uh, tuned an antenna, as you, if you will, uh, to, to, to be at that moment in time as possible, you can affect a greater change all at once. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, does, is this part of what the whole thing is about? It may be, 
Uh, I think this may be what the hybrid children are about. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's the ability for you and I to be pushed in a certain direction, for that communication to come into us. Uh, I don't, you know, these are, I really, this is the, the abduction side is the most mysterious. This, it's the thing that I can't connect enough of any dots other than, look, if we don't do this, you're going to blow yourself up. <laughs> and that's the, exactly the, that's exactly the, uh, I don't want to say the conclusion, but that is certainly within the, the, the wealth of the abduction lore of basically, you know, people being sat down in front of 3D TV screens and having this virtual reality experience of, of like seeing the world blow up or, you know, world blow up with nuclear catastrophe or seeing uh, uh, like natural collapse of the ecosystems and things like that. And then, you know, the, the little TV screen gets turned off and the little gray aliens are like, you know, monitoring the reaction of the individual. And there's also plenty of evidence. So, so I talked to a lot of people who've had the contact experience and direct thing. And one of the things I'll say is, I mean, this is just is like, I mean, this shows up, I don't want to say a hundred percent of the time, but it's very consistent. People will say, you know, I know something. I feel like I know something, but I don't know what it is. And I know when the time comes, it'll just poof, it'll appear. So you have this kind of senses that there's like some document on the hard drive that's just got like a little, you know, like a little date yes. thing, or you have to have the, like the right password or someone can, can, can remotely trigger that password. So, uh, so that comes up. Yes. So is there like this fifth column of, you know, I mean, is it subversives that are going to, that are going to all of a sudden wake up one morning, get the guns and like, you know, storm the wall. I don't think so. Uh, but that would be the concern if I was the military planner, you know, I think it's much more like, are we going to know this? Are like all of a sudden, like 2% of the population going to wake up one morning knowing the cure for radiation sickness. And I'm just making that up. I don't think that's, that's right, but that that's to something to that extreme. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to go. I, I think this is more about um, being intuitive enough to be able to explain to the to our communities to be a part of um, that new reality to be the leaders. I, I don't even I don't even know if, it was, if the word leaders is the right word, but um, to be the people who are already intuitive to what's coming out is that mm -hmm. a better way to put it sure yeah yeah yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's i mean it, I, I don't have an answer but that's as that's a, as good a line of speculation and it is much more it's much simpler than the than the sort of uh you know the x-file script i just spun there so well <laughs> it's the you know, occam's razor I, it's, well, it might not so, be yeah. occam's razor. It might something very complicated might be going on that uh, occam's razor wouldn't match at all so yeah so right right well and i think it is very complicated um as you've seen i mean I, i'm trying to connect i've got all these odd dots of things that you know, the only way I explain them is to bring them under some picture of disclosure. Uh, all, in fact, um, I was at a convention, or uh, well, not a convention, uh, expo, uh, two weekends ago, and the um, the gentleman that was working our booth, I didn't get there till the afternoon, but a gentleman that was working our booth before I got there said that someone stopped by, and they had an older, um, they had an older smartphone. And they actually brought up the point that they had in that phone a uh, a panel of turning on or off this alert system that I spoke of. You know, like mine went off a couple of weeks ago over an Amber Alert, which told me that we now have the system working here in Wisconsin. So the Amber Alert went off on my phone, 5.30 in the morning. Uh, it was on – in fact, even at night I have my phone on um, Do Not Disturb. It, it, it still went off. So – uh, this person brings their, you know, sitting there with their phone. And they said, "Yeah, we're really concerned about the collapse." And they said, "I have an old phone. And I went to shut off all my alerts." And they said, "The only one that I can't shut off is the presidential alert." Very interesting. Which, mm -hmm. which, in a funny way, yeah. I mean, there's like the, yeah, I, this is very because I think that was. So my sense is that this, the internet, the the sort of structure, the cloud structure of all the the smartphones and internet portals and things like that, that seems to me very fragile. Like, I mean, it just seems like it wouldn't take much to tip that and just like one, I mean, how, you know, how like you, you, one little silly thing on your computer doesn't work right. And whoosh, the computer doesn't run, you know? And so, so the planners have to know that, that, that is very vulnerable and they, they have to have 
on, I mean, just as something as simple as what do you call it, like uh, solar flares and things like that can disrupt things, um, or simple. So, so they have to know that, and they have to have planned for it somehow. So, yeah, keep going. Well, and it's funny you bring that up because uh, one of the things that we've had come up in the news recently, and I've seen this, you know, once or twice, is they're actually posting articles that say, "Hey, a solar flare may take out all yep. of our electronic sure. communications." Yep. yep. As well as every all uh, kinds of things, yeah. So, yeah, all kinds of things, and this is actually what Dan Sherman says is going on. And, and this is what you know, a UFO abductee Whitley Strieber wrote a book about. Oh, really? Yeah, he wrote about. I can't remember what it's called. I want to say, um, oh, I'd have to think about it. Solar Storm or something like that. But he wrote a book basically about like you know the a post apocalyptic kind of thing where uh, the the uh, the apocalypse itself is a solar flare, and then all of a sudden whoosh, our society is just all the little things that we depended on. Um, you know, something as simple as a jet aircraft can't fly after a solar storm. It's got too much electronics. Mm-hmm. So right. every single right. airplane on planet Earth, except for the old ones, are can't fly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, let me. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions since we're on the the, the subject of um, uh, solar storms and such. And actually, I take that back. I'm gonna, I want to switch subject a little bit here. So. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I came across an interesting article, and I want to ask you about two people in particular um, to get your thoughts and impressions on them, and then I want to share this. First of all, you said in one of your interviews that you have uh, uh, an impression, a, serious, a very serious impression about uh, Jim Sparks. What do you like or dislike? What is it about Jim Sparks, particular as an abductee, that you you find one way or another? What are your thoughts? You, you know, it's Jim? interesting. I met Jim Sparks at a conference. This is going back. It was 2009 or something, 2008, 2009. He was a very tense guy, very tense guy. The only way I could describe it is like, you know, like if you wanted to cast a character who plays the the, the sort of really freaked out U- or a, a Vietnam vet, you know what I mean? You would cast him. You know, he's kind of like in the yeah. corner. You can just see he's gritting his teeth. He's not at peace. And, uh, you know, and I did this little thing where I, where I spoke with him, and he was a, he's a sort of totally engaging fellow. And he um, he did this thing. Where he said, "Well, let's just let's just take a, you know, so you have fifteen percent of the population. The population of the United States is three hundred million, and then you divide that by fifteen percent." And he just was, he gave me these numbers, and I was like, "It's like I think he did pretty good." And then he said, "Oh, here's my book. I'll sign it for you." Or he said something like, "He wrote his name down in my book. I think I had like a little book, just like a little uh, moleskin book like that." And he took his pencil, and he could barely write his email address. Like it was funny. Like he really had to like he wrote it, and then he made a mistake, and then he had this kind of like. And here he was, like doing doing this kind of just math off wow. the top of his head, and then he couldn't. So great. So I mean, I got no problem with that. You know, people have. I don't mm-hmm. want to say savant. Yeah. That's maybe the wrong way to say it. But so here's a guy who's got like a, his focus is, whoosh, and he does this thing where he'll he'll say, "Well, I remember 98 percent of my, uh, uh, you know, my abduction events yeah. and things like that." And I worked in advertising, and so like. If you write ninety eight percent in an ad, man, you got to have an arsenal of lawyers that can prove that your <laughs> that your dishwashing liquid is ninety eight percent better than the the, the competitors. So, <clears throat> so mm-hmm. I'm, anytime someone does that, I'm like the little bell goes off in my head, like oh, okay. So <clears throat> he's also uh, my, my my sense is that he's had experiences, and also my sense is that he's what well, like he's embellished them, but probably unconsciously. And mm-hmm. so there's things in his book that are just a little bit outside the norm of the standard scenario that gets replayed. That doesn't mean he's that doesn't mean they didn't happen in some form. And then I also say there's so much mind control going on in this realm that um you know he basically talks about being tortured. Have you read his book? Uh, I have not read his book. Okay, I, well, he, I don't. He, he, I don't read a whole lot. I do better with interviews. But, but anyway, so um, his, so his book is basically like they abducted me, they sat me down at this desk, and they and it's like. They tortured me, yes. they, and so then they would reward me. They had like this uh, holographic image of a sexy woman, and if I did good, I could have sex with this hologram, and if I did bad, I like got you know. So so he's tortured, and now he so so his I don't want to say his credibility because this is all madness on one level, but so I'm very skeptical of his conclusions. Let me put it that way. Like mm-hmm. I, I can I'm, I feel like I'm savvy enough to read into his story. You know, like whatever someone says, they like got took behind the lines in in the Korean War, and they got you know uh, tortured by the Chinese. There's going to be a point when I'm like, okay, like their story is going to be murky, foggy. I won't have a true answer, but I can, you know. And so, so yes, yeah, so I, I have a I have a hard time with with him. And uh, uh, and then I've talked to some people who know him 
fairly closely, and they painted a portrait of a pretty volatile character, very odd personality mm-hmm. quirks, anger issues, and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, because one of the things he talks about is, you know, they can take me, you know, two different ways. And one of them is the hard way where I feel this thing in my navel and it sucks. Roller, me. Roller coaster ride any, through, yeah, through. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard that it, from any other abductees? Yes. I haven't heard it in it. You have? Yep. Not, not you know, with other people, it's not 100%, but, but that does get mentioned, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, because the second one that was really interesting in, in this information I want to ask you about has to do with 9-11. Um, we don't, I don't believe we know what happened on 9-11, and I don't even know that uh, there's any way to explain this. But the second person I want to ask you about is Billy Myers. Um, have you looked at any of Billy Myers' material? You know, Billy Myers is such a – I mean, I, his, his, his UFO photographs, in my opinion, are so obviously hoaxed. And whether that's a hundred percent of them, or all, I mean, or some of them, let me just put it. I can say unequivocally, some of those photographs are laughable. He and Billy Myers has very much taken on the role of a cult leader, so he's just very suspect, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. Now that doesn't so t- that doesn't mean that he hasn't had at one point in his life some sort of real experience that sort of catapulted him into this, you know, frenetic headspace where he then. Uh, yeah, so 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 I have not looked into his stuff, but he he like uh, channeled like a lost book of the Bible, basically, you know, claiming he was Jesus, you know. So it, it's, mm. his stuff gets very weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason I ask is because one of his things that that was so uh, that, that's odd that he claims to have is a recording, an audio recording of a UFO. Have you heard his audio recording of a UFO? I have not, but I but I okay. So, so something that I'd like you to do is uh, you can find it's on YouTube. You know, uh, Billy Myers UFO audio recording. This came. Uh, I came across this a year ago, and then I put it back in the book recently. And I only say this because uh, the new World Trade Center just opened up Monday. I don't know. Yep. Are you for, were you yep. you know Monday for business? Uh, look at this article uh, that came out uh, a year ago. Okay, I can't see it, but go ahead and just – it's too blurry to oh, see it, sure. just go ahead and – It just... says, uh, Freedom Tower of New World Trade Center, Howling Winds. Audio recording during raid storm with moderate winds in late January 2013. Sounds heard is the wind passing through unfinished floors on the new tower. The thing is, if you listen to that recording, Mike, it sounds exactly – I mean, it's not similar. I mean, we're talking identical sound to Billy Myers. And I think these kind of synchronicities – I think that I mean it's very cautious to say like oh there's proof here or something like that but I, these no, kind no, of I synchronicities agree. are the they they add a flavor to the to the uh to the overall mystery you know what I mean I think that and I, I can't remember who it was I th- I think it was um this guy who channeled God, his name is Neil Donald Walsh and wrote a series of books called Conversations with God. But, you know, when asked about synchronicity and about like little like, wordplay, there's all these funny things that show up in anagrams and, and how words are used and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and I think, and this is according to this, is, there's a quote in the book and I, where he basically says, you know, this is the way the universe likes to arrange itself. And I think that this, so yeah, so that doesn't, that, you know, that, that doesn't surprise me that the, you know someone recording a UFO when something is highly resonant and as highly charged as the site of the you nine know, eleven issue disasters uh, would you know would parallel these things. I think that's just I think a lot of the synchronicities that show up, let's say in like the JFK assassination, is crazy weird stuff going on. And I think that anything so powerfully highly resonant will just generate their own synchronicities just out of the out of the psychic soup. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that's probably a very true way to put that. Um, yeah, uh, very, very good, very good. Um, hey, let me just so 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 you're. I, it's very simple. So I'm writing this book on owls, right? Like, okay, mm-hmm. owls and UFOs, and owls and UFO abduction, and owls and mythology and stuff like that. Oh my god, I'm like, it just. I got so much stuff. It's madness. It's like it's like I, like it's not going to serve. It's not going to serve anyone to publish a 600 page book on. Owls and UFOs, right? right? And it's like, it's like right. I could. I mean, I got, I got, I got to like. I mean, because it would just. But what I'm finding is that, and I'm completely obsessed. Like I've had owl experiences. I'm obsessed. I'm digging into it. I've got this hyper, 
you know, whatever. I'm, I'm producing my own Rupert Sheldrake morphic field in a way, and all this right. owl stuff is. I mean, I just I don't do anything. I just get up in the morning, and check my email, and someone sends me this incredible owl story. I'm like the research. Like I'm not going to libraries or anything. I like occasionally call someone or something. But I mean, it's just landing in my lap in ways that is synchronistically. I mean, just exactly what you said. You saw an owl, or heard an owl the morning after we talked is like, like I. I mean, I fully expect that at this point now. Uh, and, and I don't know whether I'm onto something like, oh, here's a genuine reality. I'm onto it. Or if I'm like just cherry picking the evidence and as well as in the synchronistic cloud, I'm like a little magnet and whoosh, these little things are just arriving in my lap through a process that's unknowable that we can call synchronicity. Uh, you know, so you know, my, my sense is very strongly I am onto something. Like there's, 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 but it gets very murky. And so, am I generating the uh, the the research? You know, I'm putting a lot of energy out, mm-hmm. and a lot of stuff is coming back to meet me. Yes. Uh, and I and I and I look at what you're in, in with the internet and with all this stuff and with you know so much information and 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 I think that this subject, whether it's the more the government conspiracy side or more the UFO side or uh, that these are highly resonant, highly charged issues that will produce their own synchronicities. So I'm like, I'm encouraging you to go, go dig, dig as deep as you can. There's power in that digging in. And if the synchronicities are producing themselves, my sense is that's the, you're pulling the thread, right? And mm-hmm. the thread is going to lead to another follow synchronicity. Yes. Yeah, so follow. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, Though, and I and I think about my own owl research, like I don't have a concrete, clear answer of what the, like my, my conclusions are murky and the speculation is wildly f- fruitful. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so, so, and I see you very much in a similar path to me with this owl thing, you know, like I'm picking, you know, mm-hmm. so. And uh, and it just gives like I'm watching you go through these little books. I mean, if I could show you my desk, it's just like piled up with like stuff. I've got these. Yeah. I do this thing with these cardboard boxes that are like, um, you know, like you know, this is my filing system. So it's like eight and a half by eleven piece of paper fits in a cardboard box like this. I just got you know like so I kind of have a this is you know these are my books in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I've got so yeah. So I see you very much on a similar path, and and. Uh, you know, like I can't speak directly to your conclusions, but I can say that that from what you're saying, you know, you're pulling on this thread. You might think that there's something on the thread. It might be something entirely different. But yeah, I, but I agree. This is, this is I would just be cautious to not get locked into the conclusion, and and be much more aware of the of you know the you're going to be forced to speculate. Right. And and yeah, so and it's and it might. I mean, sometimes you like whatever you do, a little thing, a little chart, and then all of a sudden you realize, like, oh, it all leads to this one thing, like absolute zero. Like all the lines lead to absolute right. zero when you start doing these, you know, mathematical equations. And and so uh, it may very well be exactly what you think it is, but I'm just cautious to to sort of jump on board and say, like, you know, this is, yeah. But but I but I'm all for it. Yeah, keep going. So. Very good. Um, I, I don't know that. I mean, I I, I could uh, I could cover uh, hundreds of other things, but I think I've really shared a lot. My, one of the questions, Mike, what um, what research uh, in terms of um, not just UFOs but the abduction phenomenon? What is there something I haven't covered that I should research more on, or should you know look more deeply into? Um, you know, I'm looking for those things that I don't have any information in order to add to the structure of my theory, if you will. Well, so your structure, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an economic, you know, I got no knowledge of that at all, but, but I would say that. No, and that's okay. So, so, so I don't have an answer right off the top of my head. My, my sense would be to, to use your intuition and trust synchronicity and follow that uh and if it if it you'll know right away if it's if, if it's rewarding i mean i've literally talked to people who are like wait a minute i need i'm in a bookstore and they're like i need that book what is that book i need and it literally falls off and hits them on the head off of a high shelf in a library you know that kind of thing will happen it doesn't happen all the time it happens enough to so i would say trust that trust your intuition trust your gut uh i mean you obviously have to use your 
intellectual side of your head. Use it as little as possible, and then trust the intuitive side of your your head. So. You know, it's funny you you mention it. It, it, it. The you know the book will be there. It'll fall on your head. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you know again. Listen, when I heard Dan Sherman's uh, interview, have you ever just reached out and contacted him? He's a real person. He would. No, I haven't. I'm, you know, yeah, maybe I mean, whatever. Like, that's, that's what I've learned in this is like, I don't know, like if you want to ask someone, just call them up. You know, people haven't got an email and, you know, some people like, you know, I mean, some people are hard to get a hold of. They're, you know, Whitley Streeper's kind of hard to get a hold of a lot. Most people are really easy to get a hold of anyone in this. And they'll, and most yeah. people are kind enough to return an email and so, or, you know, uh, talk actually, to you on the phone. Yeah. That- yeah. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because um, uh, I actually shared, uh, exchanged some emails with Seth Shostak um, from the SETI mm-hmm. Institute, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Korhost, who was the first head of the uh, Astrobiology Institute, you know, and included these people because I wanted their comments in my book. Um, so I should absolutely do that. But, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I went into the Air Force, I was in basic training, or I was in tech school. I went to uh, Shepard Air Force Base. And... Um, I was uh, I was walking into the mall uh, on one of my first days I could I could leave base you know I mean you got 10 12 weeks here you can't reengage in society until they fully indoctrinated you in the military um and I walk into the mall and there's a music store on my left hand side or a bookstore music store bookstore uh as I'm walking in and I don't know why Mike but I was drawn to go to the bookstore and on the display right out in front of the bookstore um, were uh, audio tapes on guided meditation. Uh, one of the most amazing things. And so that was the first time I ever came across that. Oh, who's guided and meditation? Actually, I'm just curious. Was, what's the fellow's? You know, it was years and years okay, and years going. ago. Okay, I don't okay, recall. Great, I've, I've since lost the, the tape. Um, although, uh, you know, I've listened to a number of times. You said, look, I've tried to uh, uh, do uh, hypnosis. It doesn't work. Uh, an interesting piece that came to me recently uh, in my research was on Ingo Swan, who's the famous sure. um, uh, remote viewer. And Ingo Swan in his uh, interviews uh, is very clear. He says, anybody can do this. You just have to uh, create it in your brain. You have to develop the, 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 the connections, the neural connections within your brain in order to do this. So I would encourage you, uh, if you ever decide that you want to try the hypnosis again, begin that training by doing guided meditations. Um, oh, and I have been uh, successfully hypnotized. I just, just the, the, oh. I tried three times. It didn't work. I was very successfully hypnotized this summer, and I had a past life regression thing that like blew me out of the water and changed my life. And I mean, so yeah, keep going. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, very good. Very good. Uh, but it was really interesting. This is one of those interesting um, manifestations of uh, the party and of this last run. You know, as I would meet with um, some of the candidates that ran, uh, one lady in particular and her husband, I went and hung out with them for a weekend while I was campaigning. And, you know, first after we talk about just some of the more uh, benign things and what we're doing with politics and movements, and uh, then I, went and I, I explained to my theory of everything. I think this is about disclosure. We go through that. And then her husband turns to me and he says, all right, well, my turn. Let me ask you about this. Have you ever tried out-of-body experiences? Have you ever tried uh, transcendental meditation? And I was like, wow. I mean, you know, uh, it was – and there were so many things about this couple and my life that were so uniquely similar that um, it was – I was like – I met somebody, another person, another couple who – we're experiencing having the same experiences of spiritual growth that I'm going through that I was at another one of my candidates house, uh, you know, spending the night. And I happened to see on his phone that he's, uh, he has one of the same meditation apps that I use. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then I had another one. I found the exact same thing about, you know, this has been, this is part of that. Again, this coalition of all of us coming together and having these same experiences, but yet none of us really want to talk about it. And not only that, but, um, my my candidate that joined me for uh, uh, as my lieutenant governor, um, he's it's it's like I, it's it's like I've met my brother. Uh, it was just weird. I I've, I don't have a lot of uh, close friends. I haven't had a lot of close friends for my life um, because most people just don't have the same interests or they don't see the things that uh, you know. Mm-hmm. A very bright guy who was in the navy. Uh, love sci-fi. Read a lot of sci-fi books. He you know he he agrees this uh, UFO phenomenon is real. He's watched all of this. Um, all these people are being attracted. You know, when I found out Joe Buckman um, was the chair of the committee, uh, it was like, wow. I mean, I had just, Mike, I had just literally 
in January of 2013, started my, well, actually February 2013, started my local affiliate of the Libertarian Party here. I just literally just joined the party uh, two months before I heard that the chair or the, the moderator for the citizens hearing was the chair of the platform committee for the Libertarian Party. There's this odd confluence of people. And then I was at a convention shortly after the, um, the hearing out in, out in Colorado. And I met another gentleman um, who was on this same spiritual uh, consciousness UFO you know, path that I was. It's, it's been this really interesting group coming together under this single uh, entity. Yep, and I'm finding the same thing, uh, and less so in my day-to-day -day interactions with folks in the small town I'm in, but more through the internet and things like that, where where there's an atomization. What do you call it? You know, where you spray your spray bottle, and, pssst, and all the little, yeah. all the little droplets are atomized like that. Uh, uh, where there's a sense of disconnect, and I think that that is an illusion. I think a lot of people are are feel they're isolated and alone, and, I, and I'm, just, I'm talking to myself here in a way, just sort of giving myself a pep talk. Uh, and that um, there's a lot of folks having this exact same experience. I, an awakening is a strong word, but this kind of awakening experience. Uh, I think it's actually, I think that's the right word. An awakening is what's going on. Um, I was on a, I, my daughter and I, would, well, my daughter in uh, her fifth grade year, they went to the uh, capital in Minnesota to do a field trip. And uh, I was on the bus um, riding over, sitting in front with, the, with her teacher and another teacher who was doing a long-term sub. And um, she got into this conversation. She, she says, yeah, you know, I've been reading all of this L. Ron Hubbard stuff, all this stuff on spirituality. And uh, it's just been I, – I, I I, it's like I can't stop reading this stuff and trying to understand this. And she says, in fact, I read somewhere that like 50% of Americans um, are, are interested in it, are, are trying to understand more about spirituality. Uh, which was, I, I don't know where she sourced that from, but it was interesting that she would bring this up within the nature of our conversation. And that's my sense also, in, you know, in, in whether it's 50% or, you know, 5%, I don't have an answer, but it's, uh, it's enough that it's, it's real. And I think that there's, I mean, I just think of uh, Eckhart Tolle was on Oprah, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, have you read any Eckhart Tolle? No. Uh, yeah, there's what, a good what, book. Uh, his first what, book, his first book is called, um, the Power of Now. It's an easy book. Short little book. Pick it up. Open it in the middle. You'll, it'll just great. And it feels like channeled material. And I've talked to some folks, you know, like psychics, and they're like, "Oh, he's a UFO abductee. He just doesn't talk about it," you know. And he's a he's a he's a uh, he basically had a complete total nervous collapse, you know, lost his mind, and then had an epiphany. And then reemerged and wrote this book. It's, 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 you know, I mean, he basically was, you know, got so severely depressed. He was, anyway, it's a very interesting story. So they, I mean, he, he tells that, that, that story in a page at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And, and then the rest of it is just this dialogue that sounds, I've read a lot of channeled material. He doesn't say it was channeled, but it sure sounds like channeled material. And, and whether, mm -hmm. You know, and whether that you know how channeled material arrives into the psyche of the uh, of the receiver is, uh, you know, I mean that can arrive in any number of ways. You know? So so yes, so that that book is that book is great, and it's easy to find. You'll find it's you could find it any bookstore, and it's uh, just open it anywhere, and you'll you'll figure them out in twenty pages, and, and you might not even need to read the whole book. So he makes this he makes this point very clearly, and uh, yeah. So so anyway, so he was on Oprah. This guy. Has got as mystical an outlook as anyone I've ever read. Hmm. Uh, it's very approachable, very popular book, and he goes on Oprah, and the Oprah did some like nine part series of shows with him that are really yeah, I'm not maybe nine part, I'm not sure if that's, but five part at least. Oh, and yeah. I have the yeah. audio of it somewhere on my hard drive, and I listen to it while driving every once in a while, and, and so yeah, it's but it's very yeah, very powerful stuff. So, so this stuff is out there. I mean, it's out there. It's, it's, uh, you know, the it's, and I think that, you know, if someone's got a Christian identity, it's going to emerge with a Christian framework. If someone's got a, you know, uh, you know, take an LSD kind of identity, it's going to show up in a psychedelic framework. You know, if someone's got like a UFO right. thing, it's going to show up in a UFO. So, yeah, so I think this stuff is out there just needing to emerge. And um, and people and it's just got is whatever. There's many paths to. It's all leading to the same source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So the very last thing that I'd like to uh, share and just get your thoughts on, um, because I think this is very interesting. And again, you know, as I said, this is I think this is about to, uh, this is about disclosure. I got to tell you what, what's coming out from Edward Snowden is just the most uh, interesting of developments. Uh, it was actually the Snowden release that prompted someone to post the Dan Sherman piece. Uh, mm-hmm. Were you aware of this? Mm-mm. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Snowden obviously has been releasing material for over a year now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if you were, again, if you were going to try to uncover what is happening behind the curtain, right, and you've got something as big as disclosure or as the UFO ET phenomenon, um, there are things you have to get out ahead of time so that people have an infrastructure of understanding. And I think that's what Snowden has been doing. You know, we've got this global infrastructure of surveillance. Well, of course you do. And as Dan Sherman says, within every black project, uh, now, or sorry, with, with every gray project is inside of a black project. What if inside of the mass surveillance is the surveillance of the abductees? Oh, oh, I, I, I that that makes perfect sense to me. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, and so I think that Snowden may be releasing this, and that was one of the things that came out with. Uh, oh, it's so funny. We're getting a little audio disruption here. Is this on my end? Okay, keep talking. That's okay. Uh, I've I've had a little from you uh, as well. It's probably just the connection. But um, you know, you've got this Citizen Four movie that's just coming out as well uh, in America. It's already been released in Britain. Uh, it released in New York and L.A. This is the story of Snowden's. Um, Peace, but this came out. Oh, here you're breaking his... up. Oh, it's so interesting. I've never heard static like this. Go ahead and unplug your uh, oh, really? headset and just see if it if it comes through. Or now, right. just go go ahead and talk into the microphone. One two one two. Okay, here now plug it back in. I don't know whether whether it'll work or not, but man, it was it was almost you were like it was basically like. Are you back plugged? In? I am back plugged in. Okay, great. You sound better. Okay, okay, that's odd. Good, I'm Very look at the technician I am. So. Yeah, look at that, we fixed that. But this was really interesting what came out was this story right here. And what the story says is um, Snowden documentary confirms existence of new national security whistleblower. But what's interesting is within this, uh, one of the early reporters wrote this um, about the about the movie. Towards the end, filmmaker Laura Poitras' portrait of Snowden titled Citizen Four, the label he used when he first contacted her, Greenwald, is seen telling Snowden about a second source. Snowden, at a meeting with Greenwald in Moscow, expresses surprise at the level of information apparently coming out from this new source. Greenwald, fearing that he would be overheard, writes the details on scraps of paper. The specific information relates to the number of people on the U.S. government watch list of people under surveillance as a potential threat or as a suspect. The figure is an astonishing 1.2 million people. Okay. So if you wanted to hide that you were spying on an additional 1.2 million people, you would hide it within spying on 1.2 million people. Uh, I just thought that was so interesting that that... um, that that popped up. So, you know, I think the Snowden piece, uh, I'm not altogether certain that this guy isn't, um, as uh, Richard Dolan puts it, a limited hangout. But what happened recently was that he released, uh, the latest Greenwald released, was on the structure of secrecy within the NSA and how this structure um, hides these programs. At the very top, you've got very limited people. At the bottom, you've got what's disclosed for everybody else. And then you've got the onion structure Mm -hmm. uh, and how that works across all of these. And um, it was in this piece that the examiner ran the article over here that says, I don't know if you can read that, says NSA NSA, yeah, NSA document supports whistleblower claim of alien UFO communications program. The Snowden release literally showed that Dan Sherman, at the very least, worked in the black program he said he worked in, uh, which was Century Eagle. Very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. it's in, And so my sense is that anyone, including Dan Sherman, including Edward Snowden, um, that, that, you know, are they, you know, whatever. On one sense, are they on the payroll delivering disinformation? You know, in disinformation by its would have to be 
you know, two truths and a lie, right? You know? And uh, with a lie sandwiched in between, um, there's this line from you know one of the you know the, the from the X Files, one of the sort of guys behind you know like he meets uh, Mulder meets the guy in a darkened warehouse or something, and the guy says the best place to hide a lot of the truth is between two lies. Excuse me, the best place to hide yeah the best place to hide a truth is between two lies. It might be the other yes. way around. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and this has been part of the big problem we've had with, with people that have come out um, uh, is the disinformation. It's just so hard to oh, it's a- to find that truth when you've got these people that lie. But I don't sense that Dan Sherman is hiding because he doesn't confabulate anything around his story. He's pretty simple. I, look, I sat at a machine. Uh, I had a communication. and I put the information in. Other than that, here's, you know, uh, where the first meeting was. Yeah, and and then whether or not that you know, I mean, on quite honestly, you're talking about a a, a government institution with a, with a budget of trillions. You know, could mm-hmm. they have picked Dan Sherman? Could they have like just seeded him with? I mean, how complicated would that be to create a little machine that would you know blurt out little things and and uh, so yes, yeah, so could he be an unwitting pawn? You know, meant to talk about these things. I, I mean, I'm just speculating off the top of my head. I don't yeah. have any answers to this, but so yeah, so it's no. all becomes very murky. What other, what I'm more interested in standing back and getting the overall mood, let's say, because I don't think we can have the overall fact. I think we right. can, if we can just sense a mood where the winds are blowing and, and that to me is interesting because it's feels like, it feels like they know something that we don't know. And they got up there. They're following an agenda. It doesn't sound like this is all just random madness. It seems right. like you kind of step back and kind of look at the big, you know, pattern. And it seems like, well, this is a this is a program that's following a very organized step by step process. But, but that's exactly right. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's to me, it just seems so suspicious that I have so many friends with birthdays on November uh, 2nd and November 1st. Um, you know, in my life. So there's some other interesting things. Uh, how much time do you have left, Mike? You've been yeah, generous yeah, as it is. This is great. This is, I mean, I got this. I've been enjoying this. Yeah. So here's something that came out that was really interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago. UFO appears over the Hong Kong protesters. Um, which, and if you look at the pictures that, and it's a video, you can go get the video. But what's interesting is this thing comes down from the top uh, left comes down it sits over a building and then it takes off uh it, none of it is linear in direction it isn't you know a plane simply going this thing mm-hmm. comes down rolls stops and then goes straight up at the end it was it was really interesting um i think one of the things that we might be looking at is those countries like hong kong uh pushing towards that freedom movement again you know were they taking pictures with specialized equipment you know is, it, is there something else happening underneath this movement that we don't know about and my sense is that oftentimes those are those could i mean we're we're in an era now where drones could appear very much like a ufo in the in the sky so that this could one have actually been... stops this one actually stops and that, um, there right. may be technology that they have out there that can that can you know totally man made technology that can create the illusion i mean not the clear that would parallel the uh you know what we would sure. we've always called a uFO so and, they, and that would be a, if i was if I was like you know head of the you know Hong Kong secret police and I had a drone damn straight I'd be flying over that that uh protest you know for i mean you know the, for the most altruistic reasons I'd want to fly over that protest you know so Sure. Yeah. Hey, a question for you. This is another one of those interesting, um, could, you know, could, is there a connection? Isn't there? So uh, the space station, uh, oddly enough, mm-hmm. um, recently the latest crew took a picture for the album, decided to use the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as a theme for them to uh, take their picture. And that's been going on for, uh, you know, a while now where they've been doing kind of like Hollywoody stagey things where they've been, you know, playing it like movie posters. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, if, you know, if you, if you, if you read the book, are you familiar with the book? I've, I've never read the book, but I, I remember watching the BBC series back in the sev- early, late seventies, early eighties. And I, I, I saw the recent movie. So pretty familiar. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this interesting thing in the movie or in the book um, where there's a little robot that goes around and they're trying to find out the answer to the question. Uh, and the question is, what is the meaning of life? And as it turns out, the answer is 42. Is 42. Yeah. And this is the 42nd crew to the space station. And they probably knew that well ahead. And they oh, probably F- were yeah. playing. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure yeah. yeah, that's why they played this up. Yeah. But here's the, here's the most interesting. Uh, what's what's interesting about what what kind of came together for me on that? We have. Um, 
we have seven uh, or five ships uh, docked at the, at, the, at the space station. We have five ships docked at the space station. We have the new probe on the moon from China. We have a new probe uh, around Mars. We have another one around Phobos. We have another one around Saturn. Um, uh, we just left the solar system with another one. Um, and the X-22 probe just landed back on Earth. And that's the one that spent six months out there doing something that nobody knows quite what it's doing yet. It looks yeah, like a little, nobody... a little mini uh, space shuttle looking thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, boy, we've got an awful lot of cameras on space right now. And interestingly enough, the space station has had a number of um, sightings on tape that, uh, you know, of course, these don't get talked about in the mainstream media. But um, there have been at least three in the last month that have been, I mean... The, the pictures are stunning. Uh, I mean, not that you get a high level of resolution, but look, you're out in space, and, and you're pointing out in space with a the camera. Uh, there's not a whole lot that's supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here it is. Um, NASA's Maven arrived on Sunday right around 9.20. Um, uh, that was to uh, Mars. That was interesting. Uh so we've just got all these cameras uh, that are happening, uh, going all over the place. Uh, we've got, by the way, this is another phenomenon in preparation, we think for the, I think, for the collapse. Um, there have been helicopters um, doing high-speed flights around major cities in America. Mm-hmm. Um, we had this in St. Paul a couple of months ago. Um, nobody was told it was going to happen. Nobody told us that uh, they were going to be practicing this. But out of nowhere... They began flying all over the Twin Cities in very aggressive ways as if they were patrolling the streets. Um, very odd. Um, I think, you know, in the last couple of months, that's probably the, the end of it, of that. Yeah, it well, Mike, certainly did, feels like there's, there's like something's, it seems like the knob is just steadily being turned up and up and up, you know, so. yeah. Uh, any other qu- any questions, Mike, that you can think of to ask that um, I might something I might not have covered or might have come across? I, I, I'm I'm hoping to. I oh I know exactly what you're trying to articulate, and I struggle with this too. Where I'll call people up, and I mean I've like I mean I I feel like I'm in pretty good relations with Rich Dolan, and I'll call him up and basically just do just what you do. Oh this shit, it's going on in my life. It's totally making me like like basically stuff is arriving in my lap. And yeah, I, and I'm trying to process it, and like I just want some advice, and, and basically no. I mean, I've never had any good advice except for you know really practical stuff, like you know write it down and you know that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. So I mean, that's as far as my sense is. Just make sure to. I mean, it looks like you're documenting this stuff. I've been documenting my stuff. Uh, most of it has taken place in the blog. You know, there's a few things that involve other people. I'm cautious not to share, so I just I leave mm-hmm. that separate. And but I am documenting all that, and um. Yeah, I, I don't have any good advice except for just the very simple stuff. Trust your intuition. Pay attention to synchronicity. Uh, uh, don't be locked in to, you know, the winds may change. Don't be locked mm-hmm. into one avenue of thought. You know, don't don't grit your teeth and right. get stuck there because um, mm-hmm. the winds may blow you. Just just allow yourself to, to follow that. And then... And then um, Whatever. Try to. And this is advice for myself too. Try to get out and like, you know, smell the flowers every once in a while too, because this stuff is very, very uh, addicting. You can get encapsulated yeah. in it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, uh, last question then, if 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 it's all right, l- let me ask your impression. What what do you think the hybrids are about? I, there's there's enough information that I that uh, it's that that I I can't say uh, I can dismiss that it's true. Uh, if it is true, what is that? Okay, so every, I mean, I, I've talked to some researchers, and I've said so. So I've talked to a lot of people who have the contact experience. Most of the people who talk are women, and I think that I mean, so if you like, you know, I just look mm-hmm. at the paperwork. Wow, these are all women, you know, and men do talk and stuff like that. So it's not all, but 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 I think that's just a, uh, you know, women are much better communicators. There, that's what the women's, you know, they're they're men are stoic and silent. It's a caricature. Obviously, women are chatty and 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 want to express themselves. So women are coming forward and sharing their stories. I've talked to a lot of women. It is the people who've had this experience. I'm going to say 100 percent, damn near 100 percent. Like I'm I'm not keeping any statistics. So I don't know, but uh, they're all saying, oh yeah, you know, like in some form or another, they have a missing pregnancy. They've had 
gynecological issues that are completely baffling the doctors. They are, I mean, and some people are quite honestly saying, you know, there I was on board, totally conscious memory, you know, with the, uh, the you know, the, the baby being pulled out of my uterus in some sort of onboard craft thing. They take out, you know, and so it's too consistent not to be mm-hmm. addressed. What it means, I mean, I know a lot of people, do you know um, Kim Carlsberg? No. She's, she's great. She's, she's a, she's a, she's a, lives in Sedona. She's been very open with her UFO contact experiences. Uh, she's must be getting close to 60 now. Very, she's lived in Hollywood. She's a beautiful woman. Uh, she had an, she had like all in the nineties, she came forward with her story, like basically got shit on by the, you know, the, the, the grand, you know, media system, you know, hid, hid, came out in 2009 or 10 again with a book called um, Art of Close Encounters, it's illustrations that people have drawn of their own experiences. She, um, she had all kinds of hybrid story things, you know, every, like all the stuff I just talked about, she's got it all. She tells of being, going out on her back porch, looking up, seeing a UFO, like, holy shit, I got to run in and get a camera. She runs into the house, I'm trimming the story down. And there's this, it's middle of the night in her house in Sedona. She runs into her house and there's this young blonde man sitting on her couch. She looks at him. He's very handsome. She says straight up, he looks like my son, like exactly what my son would look like. She's never had any kids. She sits down next to him. She telepathically communicates like, mom, you know, you got to do, you know, like, what are you doing with your life? And she's like, well, you know, I'm old now. And I like, I'm tired of all this. And I got to, you know, she's like, and the boy's like, no, you have to do more. Next thing she knows, she's sitting on the couch and she's all alone. So, uh, yeah, so those stories show up. You know, I don't know what, I mean, it's like, so. Yeah, is, because it, you've got Stan Romanek has, you know, somewhat of the same experience. And same everyone does. Everyone does. Everyone does. Yeah. I know the woman who's, I mean, the, Stan Romanek is a good friend and, and she's a Facebook friend of mine. She's a real person. Stan's kind of hard to talk to. Stan's a kind of an, he plays like he's got this folksy side, but man, he, you gotta, he doesn't. He's got he he gives you a line that you can tell he's kind of rehearsed. So I haven't I've tried to talk to him a few times. I've met him at conferences, um, but what I have done is talk to the people around him. Talk to his wife. Talk to this woman. Her name is Victoria. Um, no, wait a minute. Yeah, Victoria. Yeah. So um, and she uh, she uh. She basically says, yeah, you know, I had sex with Stan on ships and I had a whole bunch of hybrid babies with them. And she, whoosh, she's as plain as can be about it. And, wow. and, uh, so this stuff is out there, you know, and I, w- are they, as it, are we going to wake up one morning? The flying saucer is going to land. The door is going to open and all these like people are going to walk out. And they're going to have like psychic abilities and they're going to be our, our cosmic, you know, elementary school teachers uh, shepherding us through this big change or is, are they just being held you know, in a big giant mothership somewhere. And in case the, the, you know, the population of the earth, you know, hits some sort of global uh, calamity where we all die, are they, then they're going to, then humanity will be preserved on this, in this, you know, off world place. Uh, Mm -hmm. Are they, uh, you know, are, are the, yeah, I mean, so these are just science fiction speculation. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm just, and I, and I could, I mean, there's all kinds of thoughts, but whatever's going on, and this is going back to to Bud Hopkins and Dave Jacobs, which I have you know, a lot of problems with their conclusions. But one I think I don't have a problem with is they they were pretty much saying like, listen, this is so like like uh, like if we do a scientific experiment, right? So we like go and we land on Mars and we take a little soil sample and we like test it for you know ammonia. Uh, mm-hmm. That's an experiment, right? So that so the whole time that people were talking about the UFO lore. They would say like, oh, you know, the, the UFOs are landing here and they're taking little soil samples and they're scientists. They're like us. They're coming here doing little experiments. They're studying us. And then Bud Hopkins, Dave Jacobs said, no, no, they're not studying us. They know all about us. Mm-hmm. They are running a program, a scientific program. Yes. And a scientific program would be like if you want to like bioengineer the, you know, the uh, genetic structure of corn right so that would be a program you would have an agenda you would go through step by step you would proceed along you would amend the steps in the way um and and their sense is that what we're experiencing is not a scientific set of experiments it is a organized program with a beginning middle and end and where we are in that program is hard to know right so so that that uh that's my you know that that 
having looked at and all that. Yeah, okay, and, that, and that's sort of my sense as well, uh, is that this is a program that we're working through this program. Um, I think we're interesting as all get out. But if you look at um, our planetary formation, you know, versus the, the age of the galaxy versus the age of the universe, um, I think that they've done this before. Uh, they'll do it again. And uh, although each situation is unique, much like raising a child, uh, they're bringing us through a transition into an age. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, how, how does that uh, process end is, is really the point of my book. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. How, yeah. <laughs> you know, who knows? There's yeah. just so we'll many. find out. Some, our, our grandchildren will find out or something, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Great. This has been awesome. Well, I really appreciate this, Mike. Um, yeah, yeah. This what has I, been very so helpful. it's been a little over two hours. What I'll do is um, I've got it's all recorded. Uh, I've got two tracks, one with your audio, one with my audio. That's the way it whoosh, comes into the Skype recorder, which is amazing. I can ah. put those on two different tracks of a uh, audio thing. I can adjust the levels of each of us. You know, I've, when my voice might be a little tinny or my voice might be a little bassy, I can even those out, and um, and then I can produce a uh, like an MP3 that'll be two hours long, and and um, we can both hold on to it, and and um, yeah. It should transcribe really easy. It should be easy to re you know, take through. So, yeah, I'll clean up a little bit. I know there was one gap where you checked on the dog. So, Right, yeah. Um, it, as always, um, Mike, you're welcome to uh, to do with this uh, recording what you'd like. Um, I and respect I, and your, I thought your about use. it like, like you know, like there's some good stuff here. I'm going to, you know, what I actually have been thinking about is I might send it to Rich Dolan. He would be interested in this as well as uh, um, Grant Cameron might be interested in this. Hmm. Okay. Well, that, that, and again, that'd be fine. You know, if, if you feel like you'd like to do that. Um, one last thing to let you know: I actually sent an email or an email. I dropped off a whole package with um, the editor at the local newspaper uh, of my conclusions that I think this is about uh, disclosure. So this is another piece of that. Before anything happens, if anything ever happens, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to try and get out. You know, all of these things that I'm seeing, and I, I, I probably said the whole thing probably wanders quite a bit because there's so much material to cover. Everything is wanders. Any conversation um, between two people is going to wander, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this has been wonderful and great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Yeah, this was awesome. Yeah. Uh, blow me, it was so weird. That, I mean, the thing, the fact that you saw an owl or heard an owl and yeah. then the, the, you opened the little thing up where you showed the, the booklet and it was almost, you know, uh, two years to the minute. To the minute. When you when you started that, that little thing, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I promise you, I swear to Lord. I did not look at that book. No, I, no, I, I, it was in my safe. It was in my safe a year yeah, ago. So, yeah, you don't have to prove anything to me. <laughs> so, so. Okay. Very good. Well, wonderful. All right, sir. Thank Enjoy you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Hi, this is Mike. I am chiming in at the end of the editing process. I quite honestly, there was no editing, except for one very small point where his dog was barking. His dogs were barking, and he had to step away from the desk. There was about, I don't know, 20 seconds of silence, and then I just cleaned that up. So you can actually hear where he talks about the dog barking. Uh, I very uh, cleverly snipped that out. So what you're listening to is a document, a conversation in its entirety, with about 20 seconds of dog barking uh, snipped out. There you have it. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Bye now. 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 I know. I know. I know. I know.